Oh, sorry, you don't. Yeah. Good evening. Um, so uh, I'd like to call the meeting of Union 26 to order. Um, this meeting is being recorded and live broadcast or tape broadcast? Tape broadcast by Amherst Media. Um, and I'm Mike Morris, I'm the superintendent. And the reason I'm starting this meeting is it's a reorganization of Union 26. Uh, my only task as uh, temporary chair of this is to facilitate this election of a chair and then I gladly hand the gavel over to whoever is selected as chair. But before I do that, I want to introduce Cielo Sharkis, who's the new recorder for our committees. And those of you in Pelham got to meet her last week. So uh, thank you, Cielo, for taking on Cielo for taking on this role. And just because Cielo's new and is uh, taking notes on a very complex set of meetings tonight, I wondered if we could go around and just say your name, uh, your role, um, in terms of uh, what committee you're on, and particularly noting whether you're on Union 26 uh, or not for this first round. So, Ms. Hall, would you mind starting? Sure. Sarah Hall, Pelham, and Union 26. Ramanino, Pelham, Regional, and Union 26. Uh, Kip Fonch um, from Leverett Regional and Leverett School Committee. So just to note, not Union 26. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Allison McDonald, um, Amherst, Union 26, and Region. Anastasia Ordonez, uh, Amherst, and Region. Uh, Carrie Spitzer, Amherst and Region. Uh, Eric Nakajima, Amherst and Region. And just to note it, uh, Allison McDonald is the vice chair of the region, and I'm the chair of the region. Uh, Peter Demling, Amherst, Region, and Union 26. Doreen Cunningham, assistant superintendent. Great. And so I'm going to ask, if you're on Union 26, not just for CLO, but also for the audience, could you raise your hand just so we could see who's in a meeting right now and who is spectating a meeting right now? Sorry. Um, Mr. Demling, is, I mean, you look like you have something you want to share. Uh, I, so I believe that the membership of Union 26 from the Amherst School Committee is defined as the three officers from the Amherst School Committee. So I think by de facto, the chair is a member of the Union 26, unless, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, sorry, no, that's absolutely right. I was for some reason thinking about the region, <laughs> not <laughs> Amherst School Committee. That's right, Mr. Dunling. So we'll try that one more time. So yes, um, <laughs> if you're in a meeting in, of Union 26, which has been called, could you raise your hand? <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so, as I said, my only role is uh, to facilitate the selection process for chair, and then that chair will then take on the next step of officers, and um, then we'll move on to our next meeting. Mr. Mino? Who's the current chair? So. I'm the current chair because there is no chair when we organize, but the <laughs> prior the chair, no, 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 I don't mean to be so funny about it. I'm just trying to answer. Uh, but the prior chair was Mr. Demling from Amherst. Is there any nominations for chair? Mr. Menino. Mr. Demling. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Demling, is that amenable to you? Yes. Are there other nominations that people would like to share? Seeing none. Uh, all those in favor of Mr. Demling uh, becoming chair, please say aye. 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 Nay? Abstentions? Abstain. Okay. Well, you may abstain, but you're just chair nonetheless. <laughs> okay, um. thank you. Okay, so we'll uh, move down the line. We'll do uh, vice chair next and then secretary. Uh, and just, just so you know, the secretary in this context is really vice vice chair. It's not note taker. Uh, and the real role really only comes into play if both the chair and the vice chair are not available at the meeting, and so the secretary would chair that meeting. So are there any uh, nominations for vice chair of Union 26? <laughs> Ms. Mernino. Anastasia. Uh, I, is there a second? Second. Anastasia, is this, uh, do you accept this nomination? Um, I am uh, flattered. Uh, however, I'm also a little concerned because this is a reorganization um, and I will not be running for school committee at the end of this term. So while I'm happy to serve uh, in this capacity for the next couple of months, it would require a reorganization very soon after, so. Okay, so, so we had a nomination. Did we have a second? I'm spacing. Yes, I had. Okay, yeah, second, okay. Uh, are there other nominations for vice chair? I would nominate Mr. Menino. 
Is there a second? I second. It's not me in second. Mr. Menino, is this uh, amenable to you? Yes. Okay, so uh, we have two nominations on the floor, so uh, we'll vote on the first nomination first. Uh, all those in favor of Ms. Ordonez as vice chair? <laughs> Opposed? <laughs> Abstain? So the nomination fails. One vote in favor, Mr. Menino. Uh, three votes opposed, uh, Ms. Hall, Ms. McDonald, and Mr. Demling. One abstention, Ms. Ordonez, if I accounted that correctly. Uh, for the second nomination, uh, all those in favor, Mr. Menino for vice chair, please raise your hand. Opposed? Abstain? OK, that carries 4-0-1 with Mr. Menino abstaining. Congratulations, Mr. Menino. <laughs> uh, for secretary, we'll take nominations for secretary. Yes, Mr. Doyne, yes. I would like to nominate uh, Sarah Hall. <laughs> I'll second that. I am amenable to that. Okay. Are there any other nominations for secretary? Seeing none, all those in favor of Ms. Hall as secretary for Unit 26, please raise your hand to signify aye. Opposed? Abstentions? And that carries 401 with Ms. Hall abstaining. Uh, so that concludes the reorganization uh, item. We will now turn to our joint meeting, and I will turn the gavel over to Mr. Nakajima to call to order the regional uh, school committee. You know I'm going to do that. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to. Uh, seeing the presence of, of, a, of a quorum, a call to order this meeting of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee. Uh, it is being taped by Amherst Media for future broadcast. Um, as a first item of business, actually, prior to the item number two on our agendas, um, just wanted to offer a public comment. I don't see anyone here to make a public comment, but um, it's one thing we always try to do. So it was an omission that it wasn't on the agenda for this point. And if we have a future a joint meeting of Union 26 in the region, we'll make sure that the published agenda does, in fact, have a public comment section on it. Um, I don't assume there's any announcements from the joint committees. Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move on to item two, uh, timeline of superintendent contract negotiations. Uh, this item is intended to be a discussion of the two committees, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Mr. Demling in a second for his comments as we begin. But um, this, what we're talking about and what we're not, I just want to be clear about what we're talking about, what we're not talking about. Um, what we are talking about is the question of whether or what the timing would be for our committees to uh, discuss um, the contract, future contract status of the superintendent at the end of, this, of his current contract. Um, we have the option of uh, beginning negotiations now. We could wait until some time in the future to begin uh, discussions and negotiations on the topic. Um, that's up to the committee to decide. I'm distinguishing between that and the content of those discussions, which would include items like what the length of a contract should be, um, what the, what the uh, changes and other Elements of it would be, or even frankly, I'll even include within that the desirability of having an extension or future contract or not having a future contract. This is literally about the timing of doing so. And so this could actually end up being a really short conversation if the members of both committees have clear opinions on the subject. Um, it had been the impression of um, the previous and current chair of Union 26 as well as myself, um, and then we talked briefly with Dr. Morris about the question of, you know, when do, his current contract is up in uh, June of 2021, June 30th, and um, that would mean that next year, for want of a better way of phrasing it, um, depending upon whether or not a contract is successfully negotiated, if we chose to do that, um, <laughs> If we didn't, he'd be a lame duck, essentially, as you might call it, meaning that the status would be indeterminate going into the final year. The actual contract language we have says that we need to notify the superintendent no later than December 31st, 
2019, 2020, excuse me, 2020, of, of our decision in failing any communication whatsoever, the current contract provisions automatically provide for a one-year extension of the contract, which then at that point runs its course and terminates at the end. Um, so, uh, so anyways, those are the, that's the provision in the contract. Be that as it may, um, in our discussions, and then we, we reached out to, uh, and the Cypriot may have something else to share, but the Glenn Kucher at the MESC, on the question of, you know, is there in fact a sort of standard approach or expectation around uh, the timing of when these contract negotiations occur? And Mr. Kutcher was very generous to write back. Um, I was like, we can share you the content of the email, but with you um, after the meeting. But it's, I got, we did it, we got it back from today. And essentially what he said was that it is a general expectation of superintendents that they would not, they prefer not to go into a final year as a, as a lame duck is the term I'm using, um, with no, and uh, he said there is a variety of approaches to that. Um, the most minimal approach is engaging in some preliminary discussion um, during the, the second to final year of the contract that indicates a desire to negotiate an extension or a new contract, which signals to the superintendent an interest, a general interest on the part of the committee um, to extend or create a new contract. Um, but it is, in fact, a more standard practice to um, negotiate and execute, um, as a typical matter, a contract extension. There are circumstances in which fully new contracts are negotiated, but oftentimes what they do is, given the timing of one three-year contract ending, being in year, the second year, either way you go, you're in the second year, you're counting down from two to one or from one to two, that um, rather than saying, okay, we'll negotiate a new contract and it'll be three or four or five, whatever the heck it is, years from the end, which means uh, from 2021, it'd be a matter of negotiating a contract now and doing it for one or two, three years. So I'm literally summarizing Glenn Kucher's email. But, but that the gist of it was that it was not typical to leave a superintendent hanging in terms of what's gonna happen to them um, going into their final year. Um, the comment Mr. Kucher made in addition to that was that if, you, if you're not, his advice was that if you're not careful, it can have a negative impact on staff morale or expectations because they're unsure where the district is going. You can take that, I mean, we can collectively take that advice or not. Um, but that, that was the, uh, the discussion of it. And so then um, the, the two different points then would be, I'm not trying to say everything, Peter. I apologize, <laughs> but I just have the thoughts summarized in my head really clearly. <laughs> so I apologize. I'm You're going through summarizing all this. very well. Um, so, so the, the 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 two questions, and we don't actually have to answer them tonight. Um, we can answer them then if we so choose. We don't have to answer them tonight. But also, I felt my personal feeling and, and Mr. Demling's personal feelings was that going into essentially the beginning of our year the last thing we should do is have a matter of this importance, which is obviously one of the central duties of a school committee, just sort of be out there in the ether and maybe we'll get to it or talk about it whenever, and that that just doesn't sound responsible. The responsible thing to do is to lay the issue on the table, have a conversation about it, and then we can, we can then make a deliberate decision on our parts collectively about how we want to proceed. Uh, so that's where I was going with that. Anything? Yeah, um, you can call on yourself too. One <laughs> of the camels. Um, no, that's very well summarized. I, I, uh, I guess the only the only thing I would add to that is, um, you know, once you decide which year you want to start your neg negotiate negotiation um, or evaluation of, of whether you want to negotiate and extend, the next decision point is when over the course of that year you want to get things done. Uh, and from what we've understood so far, um, most superintendent positions get posted around the November time frame uh, and get filled fairly soon thereafter. And so uh, if you were to go a different direction with your superintendent, you would want to finish that process up prior to the November uh, time frame. So that's, that was the other reason for wanting to, to get that, um, that item on our agenda earlier. Um, I think... Uh, you know, when I think about best practices, that you know, one is you know we, we always want to do best practice, and we want to be we want to be respectful and um, uh, 
uh, acting in the best interests of our superintendent. But you know, we also want to establish good reputation as a district, right? And so, um, being able to set the expectation that you know that we follow best practice, I think, is a is a wise thing, which is why we wanted to identify what that was. So, uh, I don't know if you have, you may have nothing you ever want to add on this topic tonight, but I just thought Thank I'd you. ask. No, I appreciate it. Or, or the assistant superintendent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, seeing that. Uh, so really, we're having a discussion tonight. We're laying the issue on the table. Um, are there any are there any questions anyone has, or are there any initial thoughts? Yes, Ms. Nina. We're going to discuss the timing. Yeah. What is the earliest practical time point we can begin the discussion? Um. I think now. I mean, as a practice, I mean, as a literal matter, um, not. I don't mean literally the second. But I mean, I mean, if, if as a as an earliest practicable time, we could make a decision tonight that we want to begin that process. I would suspect if we did so, what we'd have to do at a near term future meeting is is start laying out what that process is going to look like, and then probably also. And I'm not. I am not seeking this tonight. But there also are going to people are going to need to get copies of the current contract. They're going to maybe even want to review their evaluations. They're going to want to um, look through those provisions, and you may have questions you come up with that would say, um, "Do we want to change any of these provisions?" Or since they're, I mean, the bill is, is a practical matter. I know school committees always exist and never term out, but as a practical matter, there are people on the committee now who weren't involved in the previous negotiation. So there may be a desire to get up to speed on what the current provisions are and why they're there. Um, understand alternatives, look at, look at other alternative contract models and explore them. And I think for members of the, that also logically once we initiate that process, the superintendent himself is gonna be free to come up with those similar, that similar reflection has now been a couple of years, what do I think? What am I coming up with? Um, and, and my point is that point of exploration could occur even in advance, really substantively, of actually any negotiations. Because the committee's got to become comfortable with what it's doing and then uh, think of what the process is going to be for doing it. Um, so you know, you know what I'm getting yeah, at? Okay, so my point is if you, you want to... You outlined a process that yeah. could be involved and time-consuming. So I'd like to begin the process as soon as possible. Because... That, to say go ahead with it doesn't imply much because you're talking about months of review. Potentially. Um, are there other 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 comments or questions, either one, or thoughts? Yes, Mr. Um I, I think I agree. I don't know why this keeps falling off, but <laughs> um, I agree that we would want to give ourselves enough time to review uh, the current contract terms um, and look at other options. And I think given what the chair has laid out uh, in terms of thinking about, you know, perhaps adding an extension or, you know, just reviewing our different options, yeah. that I would also be in favor of starting sooner rather than later. Um, it sounds to me, given this, the process that we went through last time to get this contract in place with our superintendent, uh, it was a few months worth of work, um, and that was under, you know, we were we were a little bit rushed because the circumstances were not ideal, um, and I was comfortable with the contract that we came up with, and I think we, you know, we negotiated good terms and we had a, a good process in place with the committee sharing information and all of that, but it, I definitely would prefer to have a little bit more time or a lot more time uh, to think about the, all of that. So, I think my preference, if I were to just float a timeline, would be to begin. D you know, serious uh, review um, among the committee this fall, um, and that gives us presumably you know about a year or so before we actually have to begin the you know the formal review process and the formal contract negotiations process next year, in before the 2021 date. So, thinking about this fall. Uh, gives us a few time, a few months to talk with the superintendent about whether or not he's even interested in continuing, and then we can start thinking about the contract that, you know terms that we would want to use, and then the following fall, uh, presumably begin the actual contract negotiations. Does that make sense? Other thoughts? Yes. Yeah, and just to echo that, I like the idea of starting sooner rather than later. It's new to me, so I agree. 
Oh, I'm just wrong. <laughs> um, so, I, mean, I also agree that we should start sooner rather than later. Um, I, I, am, I am a little concerned about when we end the process. Um, I think if we end, if we go into next, for a year from now, and, and the superintendent is still in the current contract, well, so as of July 1st of next year, he's, he's in his lame duck year. And then we get to the fall, and he's less than a year. And then we're in the, in the fall where we then, after a year, decided whether we want to meet to even discuss whether we want to, ex you know. So right now we're not talking about whether we should extend him or not. We're just saying whether we should ostensibly meet in an executive session and talk about, have that discussion. Um, so I guess my, my concern is that if we, if we wait that long, um, he's into the lame duck here. Now, I don't think that, that uh, it's, that there's never a, call, a need to, uh, Go have the superintendent go into the lame duck here, um, but my, my personal preference would be to 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 see if to see get, first get a sense of where the committee is because we can't even, we can't really have that value discussion right now. Um, uh, get a sense of where the <coughs> More committee. More importantly, is. we're not going to. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, um, uh, so I, I would I would be in favor of having the discussion of getting a pulse of where the committee is to see where where it, where we want to. Where we want the when when we want the process to end, um, uh, because I, I could I could imagine a scenario in which the, the committee would want the process to end sooner. Serena, that's I was going to second that. Can we talk about a time frame with a beginning and an end? We can. I mean, I don't know that we need to. I mean, to be honest with you, if you make the I mean. Not to sound funny about well, look if we if people knew for certain when they wanted it to end, we could certainly make a decision about an opening and an end. I would argue. I guess my argument would be, I mean, I agree with what Mr. Demling just said, and I think I've tele telegraphed slightly by the beginning of my comments that I think the information from Mr. Kutcher about that it's not the norm to go into lame duck years, um, it co it colors my thinking about how I'd like to approach this. Um, but but I also recognize that we're going to do this all together as a group. All of us, every member of the committee is going to be engaged. And or both committees are going to be engaged. And so to do that, we need, we need to make sure that everyone is operating from the same information and the same level of comfort with how we proceed. And so my point being is that what that would allow me to say we could do is we could start the product, the conversation, and then whether we decide, I'm just saying this based on the conversation we've just had, if we end up deciding to negotiate a final contract a year from now, that could be an outcome. If we decide to do it sooner, that could be another outcome. And we don't really have to force either outcome now. And, I'm, and I'll be blunt, I don't think it's desirable because of what I just said a moment ago. Everyone on the committee, on both committees, has to be engaged in this process. And so the last thing I want to do is force a dis an ending decision or even a substantive decision right tonight. So I think that's I think it's not a good way to build that collegiality and the collaborative comfort. But we can clearly start if that's the sentiment of the boards. Is there any other, I mean, I, what I want to do now, frankly, oh, Mr. Fonch, it's good because you're the next person I'd call in anyway. Thank I want to go down the table and get okay. other views. Um, I would support starting as early as possible. And I would also, um, piggyback at the end that we end it as soon as possible without rushing through the process. And the reason why I think that it's important to identify an end date is that we're not only um, evaluating and um, determining whether we're going to continue to hire a superintendent, but it also has a ripple effect on the rest of the, the, the district. Uh, other administrators um, are going to look at this and wonder what, what are we doing prolonging the discussion of the superintendent. Staff is going to be looking at this in terms of what's the direction of the district if we wait until um, the superintendent's a lame duck. Um, I think that's just not good for the district. It's not good for the staff. It's not good for the administrators. So I would hope that we could um, not rush it. I, I, I'm not trying to say that, but I think we should try to microscope the beginning and end into a period of time that we avoid a lame duck situation. Mr. Dow? 
I, I won't. I, I don't have anything to add. I agree with um, the sentiment from Mr. Fonch of wanting to start as soon as possible and then keep the pressure is not the right word, but keep sort of the pedal to the metal so that we just keep going and don't sort of set this aside and just keep sort of the sense of urgency to get it done when we can. Ms. Bitzer? Um, I'd agree with what's been said before. Okay. And we should start early. Okay. Anyone? I'm going to wrap this up. Does it, yes. <coughs> I just want to add and, and acknowledge Mr. Funch and what he said. I do agree with what he has mentioned. And also, having a superintendent and a lame duck year is not a good thing to, um, for the district or for the superintendent either. If we begin as soon as possible, and I'm not saying next week or the next meeting, then we'll know, ha we should be able to put a timeline together which allows the superintendent an opportunity to, if he chooses, to start looking elsewhere if right. that's a need. So it, it gives everyone an opportunity to know where they stand. Mm -hmm. And so I think we should have a start and an end time. Well, it, yeah, and it's funny actually, because the reason I, I hedged initially when that start end time came up was that since one of, to be candid, one of the outcomes of it can be that the um, superintendent can always decide to work elsewhere. And it could be as a matter of, I mean, it could be for any reason you'd want meaning it wouldn't have to pertain to the negotiations. It could be extraneous to that, um, or even to just a life situation outside of it. You never know. And the point is, any any factor like that, my point, my, I guess my point is, responding to what Serena said earlier, is the timeline then becomes extremely artificial <laughs> because essentially, if that were the direction it went, it would end whenever that decision was made. You'd know you'd be done, right, regardless of anything else. Um, so uh, what I was hearing is I was hearing a sentiment to get started. Um, I think, I mean, we heard a variety of sentiment around how fast to move. I think the next step of that would be finding, sending out the copy of the current contract to all the members again, just to make sure you, well, I shouldn't say again, they're new members. Make sure you have it, look through it, and then um, we'll, we'll, I'll reconnoiter back with uh, the chair of Union 26 to try to figure out how we can arrange the next step. As I said, I'm, what I would like is I would like we may even consider having MASC come in as a field assistant to come in and do some training for the committee so that we can we can go into this the right way. And as I said, to me, it's extremely important to me. I respect everything the assistant superintendent said and echoed some of the comments myself earlier, uh, similar comments. But at the same time, I want to make sure all of you are entirely up to speed and feel completely comfortable with what we're doing. And I think we could do that in relatively short order. So I'd view that as sort of marching orders for September, frankly, to make sure we get there during September, this today being the 10th. Everyone good? Or anyone have anything else they want to say? You don't? Okay. And we're done with this. All right. I would entertain a motion to adjourn Union 26. So, Second. Okay. All those in favor of adjourning Union 26. All right. It's unanimous. We are adjourned. Okay. So we're now back onto the region, region only. Um, if anyone's leaving, have a good evening. Um, the uh, first item of business is approval of the minutes of August 29th, 2019. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to look at the minutes. Um, if there are edits people have, they want to. Yes, Mr. Marshall. Um, do we need a motion to approve before we discuss this, or can I just? No, we don't need, we don't have to have a motion. I'll take a motion okay. if you want to. Um, then I, um, I would draw the attention of the um, committee to uh, number four, chair's update, okay. and the last paragraph, and the last sentence in the last paragraph. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to correct that, but I don't understand what it says. I think there was an intent to convey some important information, but I don't think as it's written, there's much clarity there. So the, the, the paragraph Where it says, if a decision question. hasn't been made, if they haven't made a decision, mm -hmm. um, how they will, and thinking about the possibility of a failed assessment and budget, um, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Yes? I'd like to suggest that we rewatch the tape, because <laughs> I agree that it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that actually, it's funny actually because um, 
may seem self-involved of me that this was a section I was wanting to revisit as well. <laughs> That's, since some of these things I said, and I'm not sure I said them, is that um, I guess I guess one question I have is: Is it possible for us to do this and bring the minutes <coughs> forward again at a next meeting? Yep. Because that literally is the smartest way to do it: to just say let's not yep. mess around with it then. Yes. Ms. McDonald. And moving on to another question, I think. Can I? Oh sure. Yeah. Um, in the um, discussion about Triple E, I believe, that, um, and I'll turn to Ms. Ardonia's, um, but I believe that the comment that Ms. Ardonia's made was about standing water as opposed to water activity. So that's into the superintendent's update as well. Our superintendent's update, right? Yes. Yeah. So the same page, actually, higher up on it. Mm -hmm. Third paragraph from the top. Yeah. Yep. Okay, any other, any other edits of the minutes? Again, we're not going to vote on it tonight. It's going to come back as an item next time. I don't see any, so I'm going to move on. Okay. Um, next item, committee announcements and public comment. Just as a note, this week we actually have subcommittee updates later on the agenda, so we don't need to have them during uh, committee. Are there any announcements from members of the committee? Seeing none, let's see what time it is here. It is now after 7, and this is a timed item for 6.50, um, so I feel good about the timing. Um, is there, I'm opening public comment. I frankly don't see anyone present to make public comments, um, just also, I guess, for the benefit of people watching this on television later. Um, so given the fact that it's 15 minutes past the time, the public comment was announced. I'm going to close public comments and move on because I'm assuming somebody would have been here by now. People would have been here by now if they wanted to make a comment. And, and just to be clear, since people can watch us at home, um, public comments are only one and obviously a very visible way to communicate with the school committee uh, or, the, frankly, the superintendent. We also have email addresses and other means, and as well as written letters that can be sent to us. Um, and also, if people do come to public comments uh, and submit written comments that are appended to the minutes. Um, so just to let people know, there's multiple ways to get in touch with us. Uh, next would be the superintendent's update. Yep, and I'll be brief, partially because both Ms. Cunningham and I are suffering from the same early fall cold. Um, but um, I mentioned this orally at the last meeting, but now we have uh, more formally that the Puerto Rico Day celebration is September 23rd at 1230 at Town Hall in Amherst. There will be both uh, elementary uh, from both Amherst and Pelham as well as regional students who participate. You all are welcome to come as well. Um, and just uh, something I shared last time, but a little more detail this time, is uh, we changed the timeline. It used to be in November. Um, and uh, intentional quotes around discovery of Puerto Rico was the, the day that was historically celebrated. And so we've changed it to Grito de Lares, which is uh, celebrates an uprising against the colonial rule. So you can see the kind of 180 degree shift in terms of the celebration philosophy. Uh, it also happens during Latino Heritage Month, which starts later this for this weekend, I suppose, and uh, it goes to October 15th each year. So uh, we hope to see as many of you there as, as uh, can do. And thanks to Dr. Guevara for, uh, you know, my comment last year, like, we can't do this again on Discovery Day. And she's taken the ball and run with it. And she was at the town council last night in the town council. Um, offered a proclamation uh, and we'll be partnering on the event as well. I think many of them are going to show up as well. So thanks to Dr. Guevara for both her planning and also for being presenting last night to the town council. Uh, with Mr. Jones here. Thank you, Mr. Jones, for being present for part of the meeting tonight. There's a community kickoff day on Friday uh, this week at the high school. And I think this is the fourth or fifth year. I, I was trying to go back and remember that uh, the high school has done this. And it's been incredibly successful in having an event early in the school year where actually classes stop. So there's a condensed time frame of classes in the morning and the afternoon. Is a variety of different activities, many of these organized by students as well as faculty, to make deeper connections and to kind of stop what, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, stop our normally daily actions and get to know one each other and, and build that sense of connection that we know is critical for, for students and faculty members. So thank you for all your work, Mr. Jones. And I know Mr. Sadiq has been the primary person, our assistant principal, um, organizing it. And it's got all maps. So I got an email today, and uh, yeah, I appreciate the work. Last Friday, along with other area superintendents, I met with um, the commissioner, Jeffrey Riley. Um, I think the, the three take-homes uh, take 
he spoke clearly about are the need to increase our focus on teaching and learning. Um, not just, that, that's the second part, is reducing the focus just on standardized assessments. He described being a teacher in Maryland in the late 90s where they, their state assessment system was actually a collaborative assessment where no individual scores were offered, that students worked collaboratively together to, to uh, do real life tasks and the school received a score in the district but individual student focus wasn't the focus because we have districts already had those assessments. Um, so that's, we're, we're, far away from, we're far away from that vision but he uses that as an example of uh, how assessments uh, can be married to good instruction because he tries some. You want your assessments to look what look like good instruction, and right now that's misaligned in Massachusetts, in his opinion, and really to empower teachers to be creative and teaching to the standards. The standards um, uh, are out there, but there's a million ways to get there, and he wants to encourage and explore how to how to remind teachers that they don't have to teach page 57 on Tuesday. That we're not a textbook state, and we should be accessing the creative teachers we have in Massachusetts. Um, just a reminder that um, last year uh, there was some advocacy that committee. Oh, I'm sorry, there was. Mr. Posh. Here, just a quick question, uh, Mr. Morris. Um, in your judgment, does this um, phrase here, reducing focus on standardized assessments, suggest that the, the commissioner is moving away from uh, test being a graduation requirement? So, someone asked that question, so you're not alone. Uh, one of my colleagues asked. Um, the challenging thing for him in that regard right now is that he does he's not he doesn't have the discretion to make that decision. That's uh, both a board decision that's been put into um, formal regulations. So um, he's walked into this. He did not answer the question. He answered the question the way that I described it. It wasn't a, a yes no. Uh, but I, I I think his thoughts in general are that standardized tests served a purpose. They brought you know, he described being a teacher in Boston before standardized tests and everyone doing whatever they chose and there was an alignment and how negative that was for kids, particularly with kids with disabilities. But, you know, I think his phrase was, we've got as far as we can go with standardized assessments as they currently are. We now we need to look much broader about the student experience and, and also he talked a lot about social emotional health, um, which is harder to assess based on a standardized tool. Thank you. Yep. Gentlemen? So, um, so you've met Commissioner Riley a few times now and he's, he's a little more than a year into the job and you know, he's obviously working in a fairly conservative DESE uh, leadership environment under Baker. Um, and I, he always talks a great talk whenever I've seen him. But he has some really disturbing um, privatization actions that he's participated in the last year. I just wondered if, if you get a sense from him whether he's actually someone we can work with. He always talks of, like, I am, I'm a teacher, I come from being a teacher. And he's talk, he talks about reducing testing a lot. Um, I, I just can never tell whether he's, you know, being completely sincere in terms of trying to achieve practical results or not. I don't know if you had any sense after a year or so. So uh, a couple of things I'd share briefly. One is that uh, you're right, it's, he's come out a lot to Western Massachusetts. So I think, um, I think as a Western Mass group of superintendents, we're, we're appreciative that he shows up. Um, it's notably different from, especially people who have been in the role for a lot longer than me, notably different historically from how commissioners have, have come. My personal experience to date with him is that he's a pretty straight shooter. He's given answers that weren't the popular answers when people challenged him on things. On the particular question of privatization, that has not come up in conversations I've had with him, so I can't speak to that directly. But um, it does, my interactions with him, um, he has seemed authentic in, in being candid, even if the answer is not going to be the popular one in the room. So um, that's all I can go Thank on. Thank you. Um, school choice is just a, a quick reminder. This was a topic that came up at the region last year. There was some advocacy that, um, based on a ruling in May last year, um, our current elementary students are grandfathered in, um, but incoming students who are school choice students um, who weren't grandfathered in, in other words, they weren't school choice since as of school choice students uh, at the end of last year will no longer have a, a highway or a pathway to the region other than reapplying for a school choice network. Last year, the advocacy was well received by local legislators, but it was after most the vast majority of the budget process. So it is something that uh, may come back again, and uh, and I don't want to repeat the cycle of <coughs> thinking of this too late for legislators to, to consider it. So just wanted to put a bug in all of our mind, mind too, collective years, um, to come back to that because it is a critical issue for uh, all four towns. Uh, director of Finance, actually I'm going to skip one, I'll do that last. Um, so adaptive physical education, again another one about the high school. So just really exciting um, 
So the PIP program is pathway independence. These are students with uh, pretty significant disabilities. And, and a collaboration between the PE department and the special ed department. They've created, it's not a new course in terms of course catalog, and that's why it wouldn't come before you um, like other ones in the, in the winter. Uh, but a new program for an adaptive PE class for students in, in that program that is um, something that's new. Um, so far it's only been a week and a half of school, but it's gone really well. And I think uh, what speaks so highly of all of our students is um, students who are not part of the peer program can apply for an ALPS, which is an uh, alternative learning program, um, self-designed course to uh, improve the access of students in the PIP program. Into the, and there's a wait list now of students who want to be a part of supporting students in the PIP program within a physical education environment. Um, so kudos to um, the special ed staff there and the PE staff who, with open arms, uh, thought this was a great opportunity to expand their reach around access. And um, you know, it's just really exciting hearing the report from both sides today. I, I was able to talk to some of the special ed side as well as the PE side, and, um, and it was really neat. And it really ne neat came up, I mean, I think something I shared with the committee, certainly the, at convocation, uh, for those of you who were there, was that um, Ms. Cunningham and I have scheduled um, what we're calling Make Us Better meetings, just to get um, on the ground with any staff who wants to come, peer feedback. We had our first one of those at one of the elementary schools yesterday. Uh, but also uh, inviting two staff members a week randomly chosen to have just a 15, 20 minute conversation with me if they so choose about anything on their mind. And that's actually how this topic came up. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just like, what, what's going well? And the first thing was, this is the neat, this is neat, you gotta come over and see this, you know? And um, so it was just really nice that kind of that mechanism was working. Um, finally, uh, in less positive news from my vantage point, um, uh, last week you received an email from Finance Director Sean Magano. He doesn't want me to do this, so uh, I apologize, Sean, in advance, second time today. Um, but I really think it's worth us appreciating, uh, for me, I want to appreciate all Sean has done for the district. Um, you think about many of the major initiatives that we've had over the last few years, and Sean's been connected to all of them. Um, so if we think about food service program and how big a shift, for those of you who were here when we were in a, a model with a vendor and went in-house and before we had a food service director, as well as supporting uh, food service directors that have come since then, Sean has been critical. Um, we've had different assessment methods each year. Uh, your former colleague uh, and chair, Mr. Baptiste, you know, every year would have a, say, it's the Mangano method. And the Mangano, we're now on Mangano method 4.0, I think, or <laughs> something along those lines that has worked effectively in challenging times with four towns each with different needs and priorities um, and challenges fiscally to make that happen. Uh, but I think the thing that I want to share, you know, both with you all as well as publicly, so, you know, the newspapers can write a story, I never know what's going to get in it, is the human connection. So um, <coughs> you think of finance director, perhaps there's a negative stereotype connected to that about the level of uh, time spent in front of spreadsheets versus time spent on people. And I think the mm -hmm. unique thing about Sean is how many staff members feel connected to him. And I'm not talking about business office. I'm not talking about Doreen, myself, uh, principals. Uh, how many general staff members feel like and have been invited, just come in and talk to me about whatever's you know, on your mind or this concern. Uh, he's gathered, uh, pro he's developed processes to gather feedback in the budget process from a wide variety of stakeholders. And I remember being in this room last year where we were doing a budget update, how's the budget looking? And the comfort level that our high school staff members and middle school staff members had to ask real questions and know that they'd get answers back that were digestible, that were understandable about something as complex as the regional budget. Um, that is really unique in my opinion. So um, I'll stop here because, um, you know, Mr. Mangano thankfully has agreed to continue to work until the end of the calendar year. But uh, I didn't want to not say something as that will be more public, I guess, in terms of newspaper tomorrow. Um, and I know you got the email on Friday. Mr. Well, if I could add my two cents. Um, I think. For speaking for Levert, on behalf of Levert, um, I think we all feel that Sean is uh, one individual who, no matter what the issue is on the table, we can trust him to make the best effort to try to help us resolve it uh, without too much um, arguing back and forth. Um, I think that's been particularly true for um, this ongoing assessment battle, uh, but also during the discussions of regionalization. Uh, you were there to provide numbers that w turned out to be accurate, uh, good sound numbers that helped us try to make a decision on that particular matter. Um, you have left behind big shoes, and they're going to be very difficult to fill, not only in terms of financial expertise, but also in terms of character and personality. Um, 
I wish you well, but I'm sorry you're going. Mr. Nevin? I mean, I, I'm just so grateful for the body of work that Mr. Mangano has done for our region and our town, and the the benefits that students have received as a result of his work just just can't be. We don't have enough time <laughs> to, to 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 go through the list um, because you know it's it's all a waterfall, right? We have such a complex relationship of of, of regions and budgets um, that he manages, uh, and and you know one little efficiency has such a trickle down effect, and that creates financial opportunity for us to make a further investment in students. And so any, any, any time that, that a parent has had a, an art class that has, has, has impacted their child or a, a paraeducator that has made the difference for a child, that's, you can in some way tie that back to Mr. Mangano's work. Um, I remember when I first came on the school committee, and uh, Sean does this great onboarding for school committee members, yes. you know, where he <laughs> walks you through. And school finance is not a simple, <laughs> a simple thing for, uh, for anyone to understand. And he has such a clear patient way of explaining pretty uh, difficult concepts. And I, I really saw this on display the last year um, when we were trying to um, advocate for a school budget um, uh, change in uh, some, some state law with our state representatives. And, uh, you know, very short time frame of, of trying to understand uh, very convoluted data that DESE produces and how does that impact our district and what change should we advocate for. And the number of times that I relied on his expertise to, to make it uh, 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 clear so that, so that we could then engage, engage others. Um, you know, I, I won't go on except to say, you know, it, to say he will be greatly missed is an understatement and our, our community should be very grateful that for a time that we had him as our finance director. Ms. Arenas? I just want to take a moment also to thank uh, Mr. Mangano for all the incredible hard work that I personally have witnessed. Um, I think, as Superintendent said, uh, he hasn't just played the role of a finance director, but has also been, you know, integral to our union negotiations. Uh, we sat through many, many meetings, many meetings, uh, as we hammered out union contracts. And uh, I've just always been incredibly impressed with his ability to uh, carry information. There has never been a question, or very rarely a question, that I have asked that Mr. Mangano did not know the answer to. Um, and that just shows, you know, a very bright mind, uh, but somebody who's just incredibly open-minded and willing to find the solutions, uh, you know, no matter how difficult the problem seemed. So I have personally really appreciated working alongside Mr. Mangano, and uh, I agree we have some very big shoes to fill, and I wish you the best of luck. Mr. Marino. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I remember when I first came on board, I went to his office, and he told me about the school committee finances, and he toggled spreadsheets, and he just had a thousand spreadsheets. He could toggle back and forth and stuff like that. But uh, he's been very helpful to the Pelham School Committee, especially the school options committee that we had. He, he uh, mapped out various scenarios and was very patient. Uh, all I can say is, Sean, please don't go. Don't go. Stay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You haven't heard me yet. But <laughs> uh, well, I was going to say it during the chair's report, but since you want to say something, I'll, I will say it now. Um, I, I agree with everything everyone just said, so uh, this may be a mixed bag compliment for you. I have no idea. But I worked in state government with uh, this, the business manager, CFOs of uh, major line agencies and secretariats and uh, with a lot of the line staff at the State Office of Administration and Finance. And I think you are as good as any person I ever worked with in any of those departments. And many of them were absolutely brilliant. Um, and so you've, you've been, we've been extraordinarily lucky to have you. And whatever you do next, uh, you're gonna be successful at. And I think the heart and care and diligence and good humor that you've brought to this work is not to be underestimated. But I just mean, it's, it's hard because this work, so many of the victories can feel pyrrhic. Like the idea that you look out and say, well, I guess our district's not on fire um, <laughs> if we manage to solve the regional assessments, you know, doesn't sound like an amazing victory, but the reality is sometimes the most important thing you can do is to help keep the lights on, find ways to finance a project, 
that looks unfinanceable, and to make sure that the people who are doing the work and who are directly interacting with children and staff every day and families um, can focus on what they're doing and instead of focusing on whether they're going to get a pink slip, focus on whether things are going to fall off, fall apart, focus on whether they have the materials to do the job. So you've been at the center of every good thing that's happened in the district, and you're extraordinary. I wish you were staying, but whatever you do next, uh, you'll report back that it's going to be great, and I wish you well. So I haven't cried since The Lion King. I was like five, all right, when Mufasa, you know, the, the scene. So you guys are pushing it. Um, thank you all. Um, I'm going to miss all of you, Superintendent um, Cunningham. Um, and you have my promise. I'm going to be, remain focused on the district until my last day, and I'll continue to help the district as best I can after that. So thank you all. Okay, um, so we're, we're um, a little, for lots of understandable reasons, we're a little behind schedule. Um, I want to try to move us along. Just as the chairs update, a couple things. Um, one of which happened so quickly I could have forgotten about it, which was that um, there was a hearing last week uh, for the Joint Committee on Education on a bill that would deal with or extend um, basically no food shaming, um, ending the practices of food shaming statewide in school districts means you know things like alternative lunch mm -hmm. calling out in some way in a way that stigmatizes a student that they have a deficit in their account for foods and um, our district has continued to be called out as a best practice and um, so our representative uh, Mindy Dom I shouldn't say our ours in Amherst and Pelham sure representative Blaze doing a great job and she's very lever um, but for those of us in Amherst and Pelham our state representative uh, was testifying on, on this bill and really wanted uh, us to be able to offer our thoughts, which I thought was great, both the advocacy as well as also the desire to be able to showcase the work of our district. So um, I very rapidly put together some testimony based on information from the um, already lauded um, finance director, Mr. Mangano, uh, as well as the sort of the facts of what we did when we put it together, what the history was. And that testimony was delivered last week, so I hope that goes someplace. But I'll, I'll I'll share I'll share with you the testimony. I mean, luckily for you, since you lived it, you'll look at it and say, "But that's just what we did." And I'm like, "Yeah, I know." No creative writing. Um, uh, beyond so that was wonderful. I'll also point out Amherst Media, which is still trying to work to get these cameras live, has said that uh, Mr. Champagne and the IT department have been uh, glory to work with and have been wonderful. So I think that's really cool. Nice to hear. Um, and thanks to them. And, uh, and this, is, this may sound orthogonal to the regional committee, but it actually isn't. Um, Ms. McDonald and I spent a few hours, again, with Mr. McDonough, uh, at, at the part of the Joint Capital Planning Committee, which is a committee of the town of Amherst um, dealing with capital project issues. Um, earlier, when was that, last week? Mm -hmm. Last week. And... Um, I just think this committee and its constituent communities should be aware that there is a capital planning process that's being launched in probably a more organized way now uh, to try to figure out how the town of Amherst is going to pay for its capital needs across the board, including major big ticket items like schools and libraries and um, fire departments. But that has a flow down implication probably to um, what money is eventually available to, for things like athletic fields and recreational fields, um, let alone anything else that affects the region. So just for, I, I'm saying this both so that we're keeping it in our minds that even though typically we keep the different committees and districts hermetically sealed off from one another, the reality is, um, you know, if you got one dollar, it's only one dollar no matter how many ways you slice it up, right? And so that means there's, there's an implication to thinking about um, capital planning at the regional district as well and thinking about how to constructively engage in those conversations knowing that frankly the price tag of some other capital items for the town of Amherst are so large that if you think of like a multi-year plan for multi-millions of dollars to redo our athletic fields um, okay that'll happen I'm sure right um, again scarce dollars so we're gonna have to it's an item for a future agenda but it's something that we're going to have to engage on and then think out, 
think about how and what the best way is, aside from the regional assessment of our operating budget, what's the best way to engage all four towns on a discussion of where we think we are, are planning for our capital needs. Um, anyways, I'm going to leave it at that because we have too much to go over. Uh, subcommittee updates. Are there any subcommittee updates? Yes, Ms. Dow. <laughs> so, um, the policy subcommittee met yesterday um, evening um, briefly and reviewed um, the policies related to roles and responsibilities of the school committee versus the superintendent. Um, we don't have anything to show for that today, um, <laughs> but, and, but we will be continuing work on that at our October meeting um, and hope to bring that back at, at that time. We, or after that time, the other thing that we worked on and talked about was the policies that need updating um, because of the new town charter in Amherst. There's several about organization and elections that just need to be updated. We have direction from the town manager um, on where he thinks um, some changes need to be made, and so we're in the process of drafting that and expect that we'll be reviewing that also at our October meeting and bringing it back to this full committee after that. Great. Uh, other subcommittee updates, Mr. Thomas. So just very briefly to update the committee on, uh, there was a, earlier this year or last academic year, uh, there had been a letter that had been submitted by Amherst Media with a request for this uh, committee to consider, um, you know, uh, opening up a discussion around the possibility of Amherst Media using uh, part of the space here at uh, the high school, uh, part of the building, I should say, for their purposes, for the, the nonprofit organization. Um, and so uh, at the request of this committee, um, I was tasked with, as a liaison with Amherst Media, to you know, be a part of those conversations. So I just wanted to report back that uh, we have uh, continued, to, we've met several times with uh, Jim Lesko, the executive director of Amherst Media, um, and superintendent and principal uh, Jones also. Uh, to talk about the physical space here, to just talk about some of the ideas. Um, I think Amherst Media is proceeding very slowly and carefully, and, and you know, rightfully so, um, understanding that we have you know, also no, not made any decisions and that the district hasn't made any decisions, so this is all just exploratory. And uh, this is a plan B, quote unquote. Uh, so Amherst Media has purchased land in downtown Amherst uh, which they are pursuing at this point to see if they can build a new building there. If that does not pan out, if that does not work out, um, then this, you know, the, the option here at the high school would be something that we would discuss as a committee. So right now, just to be perfectly clear, we're just kind of keeping tabs on a conversation um, and, you know, engaging uh, the executive director and the board of Emerson Media and the principal and staff here uh, in answering any possible questions and just thinking through some some potential scenarios, but I'll keep reporting back to this committee if things develop and as they change. Great. Any other committee subcommittee comments? Okay. Seeing uh, none, we'll move on to new and continuing business item A, in which there is a potential vote that we can take this evening, is to offer feedback and vote uh, if we choose to on the superintendent's goal for the year. So I'm hoping and assuming that. The superintendent would introduce this topic. Absolutely. So thank you for the feedback at the meeting uh, a week and a half ago. And so what I, my process was is I tallied um, where people, uh, the things I heard most often from the different committee members. I looked at, the, you know, also the content of it, but you know, I started with just a scatter plot of where did people prioritize, what did people prioritize, and how did they prioritize things. And then... Uh, came up with a list of four goals for your consideration. Again, could be voted tonight. If there's different feedback, certainly could come back two weeks from now. Um, the month of September would be um, be great to have these voted um, before the end of the month for sure. Um, so I'll just read them aloud. And there's, there's one thing I wanted to add onto the first goal in terms of a standard. So the first goal is to develop a, develop a conceptual framework on wellness that includes issues such as substance abuse, LGBT inclusion, and later start times, among others and begin implementation of an action planning along these dimensions. It lists two standards. One thing, and, and I'm sorry it was a draft and didn't get on here, was uh, adding standard 3B1. Uh, and I'll read that since you didn't have it beforehand. 
which is about um, sharing responsibility indicator student support. And it's really about providing professional development, both for staff, but also for the community on issues of wellness. Um, um, so I apologize that that was omitted from this version. Um, goal number two, uh, or the draft goal number two, is complete the study of the viability and implications of moving sixth grade to the middle school and engage the larger community on the findings of the working group to gather additional feedback to inform a, a future decision or a decision on this topic. Uh, that incidentally was the most common response when I tallied up just for what it's worth, um, the different responses of different committee members. <coughs> Draft goal number three is to continue to diversify our staff through the refinement, <coughs> excuse me, of our hiring process and provide ongoing professional development on diversity and equity to all staff members and administrators. And goal number four is engage the faculty and staff of the schools to complete the strategic planning process by adding initiatives that will achieve the objectives, begin implementation, evaluate effectiveness based on evidence, and make course corrections in the plan where needed. Um, I think um, one thing to note is that uh, three of these four are directly connected to goals that were prior, um, that they're, and they're not the same, but they are continuing this key critical work in our district. Even the one that isn't, which is sixth grade to the middle school, was part of a, a larger capital expenditure two years ago to look at the, the infrastructure needs and now is continuing the work. So. Mr. Donis is always uh, reminding me in a really positive way that, that you know, we're an organization that should build on future and on previous work, work that was done well and needs to be extended, and work in the wellness case where I think out of my goals last year, both in terms of how the committee evaluated by my own self-evaluation, didn't necessarily get as far on that goal as some of the other ones last year. Um, so I want to get back at it and, and make further progress. As I said, I'm open to any feedback. Um, so questions, questions or feedback right now? Absolutely, yeah. All right, uh, I'm going to just uh, start over here and run down the line. Um, I like these goals. I think you did a good job um, summarizing uh, the feedback from last time I was here at the meeting, but I saw the meeting. Um, I, 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 like, I like, so one, one thing I think is going to be a challenge for you, oh, by the way, I, I also feel comfortable voting these tonight. Um, I, I think uh, number four is fairly ambitious in terms of its, its scope. Um, of um, you know, initiating the objectives, begin implementation, evaluate the effectiveness, make course correct. That's a lot. <laughs> um, so I think, I think scope, uh, particularly in the evaluate effectiveness, mm -hmm. you know, because you're going to have to wait until things actually happen to, in order to evaluate whether what you've tried to do <laughs> is effective. And you, know, you may just run into a, a time constraint with the, the year and, and whatnot. But um, I think that's one thing we'll watch. And I really appreciate uh, my other comment. Um, uh, on number one, develop a conceptual framework. You know, when I first read through uh, how you described this goal on wellness, uh, my, my initial reaction was, well, it doesn't seem very well defined. But I think that's the nature of this topic of wellness. And I think I've, I've heard that in my own comments about wellness. I've heard that from comments from other committee members that this is a really important area to focus on. Uh, it's, it's become increasingly important, and yet it's pretty hard to articulate exactly what the main line thread is. So I really like the develop a conceptual framework. Um, and I would look forward next year's goals, um, having those build on, on this. Ms. Uh, thank you. I also agree this is, it's nice to see how you um, edit the, the goals, for a better term. Um, I would echo um, Mr. Dudling's comments that I originally was a little uneasy with just developing a conceptual framework, but I believe that if we're, um, the second part of that sentence is begin implementation of an action plan along these dimensions. So I wonder if it's, you know, before you can begin to implement the action plan, you actually need to go from concept, conceptual framework to action plan and then implement that action plan. So it almost feels like there's just a little bit of a step missing there. Um, but maybe the conceptual framework is the action. I, I guess just some clarity on the terms there, because I think you, um, easier to evaluate whether or not you've achieved the goal for um, clear. Um, otherwise, uh, one other comment, which, which is with um, engage the faculty and staff of, for four, engage the faculty and staff of the schools to complete the strategic planning process. Remind me, I, I felt like the strategic planning process originally involved folks outside of just the, the faculty and staff of the schools. And it's fine if at this stage, now that we've got the, the, the broad outlines that we no longer continue to engage with those folks. Um, but I, it was just a question whether or not there are people outside of faculty and staff who would be a part of that process. Please. Yeah, so um, 
you're absolutely to the answer to the the assumption you had is correct that it was a broad cross section of stakeholders who participated in that process, and for us, you know, just hearing from and I actually talked to Dr. Massad today, who's been our facilitator and is going to stay with us in a more limited role this fall as we as we work on this. Um, when we get to the initiative section, it's essentially saying, okay, we have these objectives and outcomes we want, and now we need staff to both um, who are part of the process, but the more larger collective staff uh, to both. Um, understand where we're headed, and Mr. Jones and, um, and Mr. Smith led sessions on this uh, actually at the beginning of the school year, and then figure out how are we going to get there given the constraints that we have 180 school days a year, and there's a lot of other things that staff are responsible for. So um, I think I could edit the language a little bit on that, but it is a more staff-directed uh, role to figure out the kind of how to get from point A to point B now that we've defined what, where point B is. Um, that their feedback and input um, helps drive this part of the process because they're the ones that are eventually going to do the work. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but I think you're right, it's, it's a valid critique, like how do we continue to engage a broader set of stakeholders even if the more directive process will be um, heavily staff driven. So that's helpful feedback. Thank you. Mr. Jones? Uh, I agree with every comment that's been stated so far, and I appreciate the way that you've pulled together the very diverse comments, I think, that we had <laughs> at our last meeting. Um, and uh, the only thing that I would say is on number three, the, the point about diversifying staff, um, I believe that most of the conversations that we've had around diversifying staff are actually related to equity in the district. And the di diversification of staff is actually to benefit students, ultimately, right, and to benefit our district. So I would like for, um, for that to be reflected in this goal some way. So perhaps it's continue to diversify our staff for the purposes of improving equity in the district. Uh, but I think it's important for the community to hear and to understand that it's not just about uh, adding more people of color and different experiences and identities in staff, but that ultimately that's to benefit the kids that are that are coming here. Yeah, and I think if I could yeah, comment briefly on that, and not to belabor, but um, I think that's true. I think a, a secondary goal, but an important one, is also to continue to improve the retention of staff of color as well, and the experience of staff of color. So, both things can be true. They're not competing; they're actually complementary. Um, but I think, from our vantage point or my vantage point, I'll say um, that. Both of those things are really important and both perhaps can be called out because I think it's um, it's not just about the recruitment, it's the retention piece is, is also um, critical as we've discussed. So I think being explicit about that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Connell? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I um, will echo a lot of what I've heard from, from everyone else here. Um, I, too, struggle with understanding what is precisely meant by a conceptual framework. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's a way to build in some specificity of what, what that looks like, um, and I like the suggestion of, of maybe actually spelling out that it's an action plan, or maybe it's just changing the word includes to addresses mm -hmm. um, these issues and then implementing the action plan, but some something feels missing there. Um, and I also agree on the, the comments about um, number four. And it's interesting because that seems, feels like it's the big, one of the biggest goals, but only has one <laughs> rubric that it addresses. So um, I don't know if that, if, if, if that is the case. I don't know the rubric very well. But um, I, I can't remember who called out the question about evaluating effectiveness um, if we're still identifying initiatives and just going to begin implementation. And so, um, and we talked, I think, the last time about this being a multi-year goal, that it's not necessarily, it, it is a strategic plan, so implementation is going to begin and we're going to be evaluating effectiveness over the course of several years. So maybe phrasing that in a way that addresses that and reflects that it's a multi-year evaluation process. Thank you. Mr. Um, on the, the Leverett School Committee discussed the eight goals last night. And uh, I can tell you that they were very impressed with the breadth of what those goals were. However, they um, expressed considerable concern <laughs> over whether or not um, it's possible to fulfill all of the goals and objectives. So it's, it's good to see that you made some effort to kind of condense without um, 
losing the impact of the substance of the goals. So to be applauded for that. Um, I think it also, given the language of all four of these goals, it, it's related to what our discussion of the evaluation process. Um, I see the language here as um, a bit vague and a bit ambiguous. Um, you know, when are, when are these goals intended to be achieved? Um, and are we going to give you enough time and space to be able to do that? Um, that kind of concerns me. I'm not saying these aren't possible or yeah. noteworthy goals. It's just that I think that um, there's a very strong connection to the evaluation process, and I want to make sure that the, while we're looking at these goals, the evalu evaluation is fair to you. Um, also, um, in number one, I would um, like very much to make the suggestion that you include the concept of mental health in that language. I think it's a bit more explicit, um, and it's in, di in addition to the other concerns that you've articulated there. Um, excuse me. And um, I want to finally commend you on your effort to integrate and mold these into um, workable language. Um, it's really hard to do that, especially with these sort of um, I don't know, broad concepts, conceptual framework. Um, but I think it's on the way to being able to come up with language that is easy to communicate to stakeholders. And I think that's really important. Um, and finally, I actually I lied, one more. Um, <laughs> number four. Um, the, um, I, I worry about number four because if you look, as I look at the strategic plan, it's enormous. Um, <laughs> it's, it's um, well, it's enormous. And I just uh, worry about <coughs> us setting, or you setting, um, expectations too high that you can only fall. And I hope together we can work to keep some sense of um, objectivity and realism as, as you proceed on these. Um, I think that's really important. Otherwise, uh, hats off. And we can find the the rubric would contain the information as to how we would know if these are achieved or when they're achieved. Yeah, it's a, descri it's a description of how you should be looking right. okay. at it. Thank yes. you. Mr. Mina? Well, the four goals are laudable. They're clear. Um, what I look forward to is the preparation of the uh, rubrics for assessment purposes to see how you actually did achieve these four goals. Um, I'm no fan of strategic planning. I went through 40 years of it at the university, but my experience here has been it's been implemented nicely. The initiatives have been fair. They did uh, involve various stakeholders. And um, we do have a strategic plan, which I think is uh, admirable. Um, I look forward to your uh, assessment. What is it? I forget what you call it. Um, I had it slip my mind. Portfolio? The list of accomplishments artifacts. right before we do oh, the evaluation. Oh, I guess it is artifacts, not yeah. portfolio. Yeah. Art, the artifact. The artifact. I don't know why I was thinking of portfolio assessment. It sounds nice. I like it better. Um. <laughs> well, I look forward to the artifacts document. That's it. For you. <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, yeah. Yes, please. I'd like to comment on the goals, too. You may. <laughs> <laughs> so when I look at goal number three, it talks about continuing to diversify our staff, and it continues on to look at the refinement of the hiring process. And um, I agree with Anastasia with what she has mentioned. And I'd like to add that instead of um, looking at refining the hiring process, we look at identifying and addressing barriers. So the process was refined, yes, and of course anything, everything can uh, continually be refined. But if we can identify what is causing this um, to not occur as we we're hoping it would, mm -hmm. that should be something I think would be a, a better goal for the superintendent. And uh, in addition to that, identifying the barriers, that we look at how we can grow our staff professionally, not just the, pro um, the professional development that we have, but have our teachers maybe go into an administrative program that we help support them. And just as we have the the um, special ed program, 
that we in district are providing so that our teachers can get an add-on special ed license, that we look at other ways to grow our teachers and our staff. Cool. Thank you. Uh, I don't have anything to add. I mean, I honestly, I, I think I, no, I mean, this, all the comments collectively have been, I think, really helpful and really informative. And uh, I basically agree with them. I mean, including, so I just, I think that, uh, and, and honestly, for, in, as substantively the general categories, I think makes enormous sense to me. I think also as tough as the strategic plan is to do, um, we just started doing it. So like, it's gotta be on here, right? <laughs> like there's not any choice. And, and I, I agree with what was said earlier that um, you're not, we're, we're not, you're not really, in my opinion, you're not really going to be using an evi evidence-based tool to evaluate the effectiveness of the strategic plan this year. Right. That's silly. Um, I think actually even establishing an evidence-based tool, right. which you would want to, which would be transparent, explicable to third parties, and could be used going forward, would be completely awesome. Um, I mean, by the way, good luck doing that. Because like, that sounds hard <laughs> enough, right? Uh, especially something that corresponds with data we actually collect. Um, and, uh, and then similarly, I think the language on the front end, I don't want to go through everything people said, because I, when I said I agreed with it, I do agree with it. So like the first one needs to be tightened up to figure out what actually it's doing. Um, I love the edits to the diversity so-called goal. I think that's great. And then similarly on the last one, I think you should just think about think about literally what you're going to do this year and whether they, you point to a multi-year or don't point to a multi-year. I mean, it, it's really about the next nine months. The only thing I'd say, too, is that we, we can't vote on it tonight because we can't vote on a tool that we don't have the exact language that nine months from now we're going to be looking at the exact language, right? So we got to do that first. The good news is, I, what I did not hear, and members of the committee should squawk if, they, if I'm heard wrong, I didn't hear anyone say that the general purpose and direction is wrong, which means essentially right. when you get up tomorrow morning and you think about what you're doing that day, you can effectively start acting as if these are your goals, even though the specific language that characterizes them won't be voted on until next time. Make sense? So now please, anything else you want to add? Uh, the last thing was what I was going to suggest, so we're on the, a line that, you know, I'll do some edits, we'll bring them back next time, but that I, what I heard was the same as what you just said, that general direction makes sense, um, cleaning up some language, clarifying, uh, setting some of the goals, come back in two weeks. Right, and part of the reason I'm I wanted to make that final point that you just made, too, is that for public, you know, tuning into the meeting and watching it, I don't want to get a sense that we're just cavalierly saying, you'll start thinking about how to implement this stuff you know, in a month or whatever, or in two weeks or three weeks. It's like, no, you're, you've been thinking about it already and you're working on it already and, you know. And it's actually why I like the assistant superintendent's uh, edits because um, you'll be doing that as a team anyway. So it's not like, it's not like uh, you know, you'd ask her tomorrow, so what did you think anyway? <laughs> oh, darn it, I wish I had edited it. So it's better to have the conversation now. That's uh, all right, so we're going to move on and we're going to look forward to that coming up again in the future. Um, for a vote. Um, school committee goals, calendar, and agenda items. Um, I'll invite the vice chair to offer her comments as well as superintendent. The only thing I'm going to say at the beginning is the reason why the front end is better of this uh, calendar is better defined in the back end is that when you think of the conversation we were just having, a lot of what the superintendent's going to be doing is working through now, okay, how do I operationalize these things I said I was going to do that the committees agreed I should do. And so that has some implication for the front end of our calendar, but it has a huge implication for the back half of our calendar, where ideally there would be reports out or engagement with the committee. And we, it would be art, completely artificial if uh, Ms. McDonald, you know, uh, Dr. Morris and I had just sort of made up stuff and put them in blanks. Um, so they're, they're, the, the back half is intentionally thin because it's going to be filled out as we go. So I'll, I'll invite um, one of you to any other thoughts you have on the calendar. Um, no, other than just a, a, a high level sort of overview of our of, of how we got here. And um, we took the the discussion that we had um, at our last meeting and sort of where we thought we were the the discussion about the goals and started to um, map that out, how that could look like, because part of our conversation had been what can we feasibly 
as, a, as an organization, the committee, but also the superintendent manage, um, given our, our, our meeting schedule and the fact that we really want to keep to our efficient two and a half hour meetings. <laughs> um, so this was a, an attempt to sort of illustrate what that could look like. Um, and, and as Mr. Nakajima pointed out, that we've really only, we're really only looking at the first three months here, and then the latter part of the, the year will start to get populated once we have more concrete goals and, and know what, what, we're, what the timing and what that could look like. But it will follow and mimic some, uh, a little bit the process that we took for this first, um, first few months. Mr. The superintendent update reminded me of a topic for further discussion. When do we, at the end of this meeting, we propose topics to be added to this list? Or can we add them now? Or? I think you can add some of them now if you want. Uh, the focus on standardized tests. What is the philosophy of the school? I don't know what it is. I've heard Amherst High downplays to focus on standard exams, but how do you downplay it? Uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Spitzer. Um, just as the chair of the evaluation subcommittee, I think we mm -hmm. could, I don't see a reason why not, maybe somebody would want to advocate for one. Uh, we can't start adding into the end of the year the evaluation. Okay. Um, I mean, the specifics of those things aren't, but we know we're going to have to do that. If right. Unless, could I see some? Dr. Morris? Um, I can wait till Mr. Dunn's. I actually just want, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll. I didn't see, no, if you're, I didn't if you're see her responding hand to hand Ms. Spitzer, please, yeah. I, 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 you can. I wasn't. Okay. It wasn't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, we, of course, just had a long conversation around uh, our finance director who is mm -hmm. leaving at the end of the year. Um, and so it makes me think that we have a budget process that is starting, uh, you know, at the beginning of the new year. And we also had a conversation about trying something new, which was sitting down and reviewing the budget in more detail and taking some time to do that. And so I'm just wondering if we can include that, you know, some of those timeline things in here, because they will affect the budget process this year in multiple ways. Um, so, you know, I see that the FY21 budget projections and process for October 29th, I'm mm -hmm. not sure if that's the sit-down review you know, the process that we had discussed at the retreat or if this is something different. Um, but in any case, I just want to make sure that we're highlighting that in some way in this calendar. I just remembered another edit for the, for the minutes. Um, when I went through the minutes um, for the last meeting, one of the things we said was that there was going to be a budget um, subcommittee that would meet and would go through this a potential recommended process and timeline and report it back to the um, to our committee, to the total committee. And so what the October 29th, and it could be moved up if it could be moved up, but the October 29th budget item was not only sort of the initial budget discussion, but it was also an opportunity for that subcommittee to report back its recommendations to the full committee on how we could approach um, budget deliberations in our budget process for the year. I mean, we could move it. In other words, in other words that, having explained that's what that means, if folks have another idea, we can do another idea. But that was the, that was the intent of it. Yes, sir. Uh, I think that makes sense for the subcommittee to come back. Uh, but I am also thinking that you know it, it seems to me that we would probably need to add. And maybe I, I don't know what the committee's uh, response to this would be, but I think it feels like we need to might need to add an extra meeting or a special meeting specifically for this purpose um, that allows us to really dive into the budget uh, for, you know, a couple of hours, right? So it's not just mm -hmm. having it be an agenda item on another, you know, regular school committee meeting, but really have it, have it be its own thing. So I have a question for you on that. My, my assumption was that since we talked at the retreat and there seemed to be a really favorable response mm -hmm. to having a special meeting just about the budget, are, are, is your so my assumption was that one of the recommendations that could be reported out by the subcommittee would actually be for there to be a day or a special meeting and that that 
but that the good thing about the report out would be that it would be then synced with all the other decisions and things we're going to be doing. So that instead of making a decision, we're going to have a special meeting. It's more a matter of we're adopting a process. Here's where that meeting fits with other things we're doing and other decisions we're making. So are you thinking we need to find time for that meeting, that special meeting now, or can we wait to have that report out? I mean, you know, again, I think it's it's up to the committee. From from my perspective, I think it, because we're calendaring, yeah. it, it seems to make sense that if we want to fit in an extra meeting, you know, that we can you know, uh, work that with the committee while we're together in public and, and mm -hmm. you know, sort of ballpark an, ex, you know, an estimate date or something, uh, or at least a week when we would want to aim for that. We also have, you know, superintendent and assistant superintendent here, so hopefully they would, and, and <coughs> Mr. Mangano, at least for a few more months, uh, it could also help inform that thinking about timing. Right. So. Mr. Morris, Mr. Morris. Could I make a, a non-content, but more of a process suggestion? Sure. Um, so I wonder if at the end of many meetings, our past practice has been um, future planning. Mm -hmm. If we keep this as a living document and this document actually comes in all the agenda packets so mm -hmm. that, like I'm thinking back to the comment about superintendent evaluation timeline. Um, I know we had a conversation in one of my other districts um, about whether to align or not align. In the past, they've all been roughly aligned with timeline. I think there's an interest at least to re-engage that conversation. Um, so that as subcommittees, whether it's the finance subcommittee or an evaluation subcommittee, that we're just constantly coming back and filling in, you know, and I don't expect Ms. Spitzer to give me an answer to that now because I don't think, my understanding is you haven't, like that conversation hasn't happened, but if we make it a more regular item than um, not just looking at a meeting or two, that way we can kind of calendar more regularly so we have kind of this map yeah. um, and then we can come back and, and have this conversation each time so as things come up from any subcommittee or any committee member, uh, we can then plug in. Because invariably things are going to come up that aren't on here mm -hmm. that are not predictable, like the thing I mentioned about school choice at the beginning. I mean, my hope would be at some point this fall, that's not on here explicitly, but right. um, that we get that. So I don't know if that's a, like a, a protocol that we could use, um, perhaps. Well, I think, I think that makes sense, and I think we're going to need to do that yeah. anyways, because by essentially being, again, for the public who might not have been might not have watched the last meeting yet. What they should be aware of is that we've been trying to be, as a committee, um, with the leadership, of the administrative leadership of the district, more intentional and sort of organized about how we're doing our calendar, which helps with transparency, helps with the staff preparing for these meetings, helps us prepare and think and engage the public. Um, and also it respects the fact that we have limited time and how do we use that time well and most effectively. So for people who are aware out there, that's why if you're looking, it looks like we're bringing out our our old-fashioned use terminology, our day timers and figuring out when we're going to do different things, there's actually a much deeper purpose behind it than simply, you know, organizing agendas. It's about really organizing our work more effectively. So I think in order to do that, that means we're engaging the committee, we're engaging um, the, the Superintendent Evaluation Committee and others. They're going to have to, the Budget Committee, they're going to have to report back. In order to do that effectively in a way that allows us to engage, it'll have to be on some level a living document. I mean, if there's any, I guess one thing I'd ask Mr. Mangano, and if he's given any thought to it, if there's a time that we think we would want to do a deeper dive on the budget that could be calendared, we could, if we knew that now, it actually isn't a bad idea at all for, um, for uh, Ms. Figueroa probably to try to figure out, like, what dates on the calendar could possibly work, right? Because that's going to be hard to do. So I don't have a date in mind, but I do want to update. So the Budget and Finance Subcommittee is scheduled to meet on the 17th. Yeah. Um, and so we could come back. I think there's a meeting shortly thereafter on the 24th. We could come back at that meeting with the budget calendar more vetted and then have a date um, for the committee to consider. Yeah, why don't you do that? Okay. Unless the committee objects. Yeah, um, I, I might very well get stoned for um, starting off my comments with this. Um, but I, I, I'm very hesitant to not to cancel any meetings, uh, regardless. Um, and that's because it, it, this is the only opportunity for me to find out what's going on in the schoolhouse. Yeah. Um, and so any, we had this discussion last night in Leverett, and I lost um, because people don't like meetings. But for me, um, this is a window on, on your reports, et cetera, really provide that. So I like to have our meetings. Having said that, though, I noticed that this calendar is front-loaded. 
um, and purposely so, because other people's dates sort of dictate what we do here. And I'm wondering if, when I look at the second page, and particularly the third page, um, if we might not um, project some, in what I consider to be important discussions for later on in the year, specifically your goals. If we could have a report on each of your goals, one goal a month, uh, beginning in maybe late winter, early spring, uh, that might be a good use of those times. Uh, and it might also um, coalesce with the evaluation process. But if we hear some detailed reports about where we were and where you are now, say in April, uh, that might be a good way of using that time. Just for the, one second, I'm sorry. Just for um, uh, purposes of clarification, um, no one's suggesting taking away any meetings. In fact, the only thing we're trying to do is run the meetings we have more efficiently uh, and more effectively. And in, in fact, actually, the only motion on the table, so to speak, I mean that metaphorically, not literally, was to add a meeting. <laughs> so you're in luck. We're actually, we're only adding meetings. I'm really here. excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and as I said earlier, I mean, I think, we, I think there's been a general consensus that where we can fill in items on here now, including about like the evaluation process, which would include review of goals, we'll try to do this as soon as feasible for the next, hopefully, for the next meeting, so that we'll, we'll, we'll make a stab at doing that. Assistant Superintendent. I just wanted to add that the School Equity Task Force did have some goals that I have been reporting on annually, yes. and I'd like to add them if possible, either to the May 26th or the June 9th meetings, and that would specifically be on discipline data and possibly the progress of the RJ um, course or program. Do you want both meetings or one of them? Well, we can split it one in each. Okay, cool. Yeah. May 26th and June 9th, right? Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Because we have lots of other work to do. I don't know just tonight, but I mean, all we've done with this item is make more work for ourselves. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> All right, so we will we will move forward. The next item on our agenda is the pool contract. It says here discussion, not vote. So I guess we're having a discussion. Hello. Um, so there's a little memo in your packet. I'll probably just go through it, summarize the each question and the response. So this is a follow up to our discussion at the last meeting. There were some questions and additional information that was requested, um, and so this is what we have so far. Um, so the, so just in general, one thing that's changed since the last time we spoke is LSSC, Leisure Services, has also come to us and asked for more pool time because of the Topman closing. Um, so that in the last, I don't know, week, that, that happened. Um, so when we get down to the calendar, you'll see that piece of it. Um, but the first question that uh, was asked last week was how much was Topman charging uh, for the pool usage? And it was very, very low. Apparently they came up with a rate when people first started using that pool and it was um, never increased, which may be why it's the pool closed, I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm not going to make assumptions about that, but um, but it was in the $8 per hour arena for one of the renters, but both LCC and the Tritons also use Topman, so um, they're both in that same boat with having to find alternative space. Um, does the swim team need the equipment that was proposed to be donated? Um, so I haven't got a definitive no, but I'm getting the no vibe um, that the We've survived without that equipment, and the equipment's not super new. Some of it's newer, but um, it's not super new. And that um, would we use it possibly, but it's not a need of the of the swim team or the school district. Um, are there any scheduling conflicts so far for what's being requested? And the answer is yes. So when I factor in the new request from LSSC with what's being requested from the Tritons, you can see the two calendars there. Um, there are some conflicts on. Tuesdays and Thursdays potentially, on the weekend potentially. Um, so there are conflicts that we have to uh, hammer out. And so I've reached out to the Tritons and LCC to schedule meetings so that we can at least, before even you all decide on you know what we want to do, that we can have a, a calendar proposal that works. Um, um, at the same time, I've got the tentative schedule from the swim team and our local, our high school swim team. Um, we wouldn't have any conflicts during the week because um, they practice before any of these times start. 
Uh, but when there are meets in our um, pool, that, then there would be a conflict. And that's always been the case. Um, and both the Tritons and LSSC know that when there's a swim meet that they're not going to have the pool that day because they go till 8 o'clock. Um, does DPW have any concerns? So I reached out to him. Um, I'm actually talking with Alan Snow tomorrow, who um, works for the DPW and has been the lead on maintaining the pool. So I'll get more information tomorrow. But um, we did reach out to them. And what do other pools charge? So we reached out to UMass and Hampshire College. Um, haven't been able, to, haven't heard back from either one. Um, I did talk to a neighboring town, which charged forty to sixty dollars per hour, depending on, um, I think, certain days of the week and certain t peak times. Um, but they also provided a lifeguard, so was, you have to factor in that there's a lifeguard cost in that uh, rate. Um, and so, in general, uh, the main thing we we're uh, going to ask you tonight is if you're open to us coming up with some sort of tiered fee schedule um, for both LCC and the Tritons to factor in their transition out of Topman and, and using our pool more with the input from um, our facility department, other stakeholders like the DPW um, and, the, and the high school swim team, um, and to bring back some sort of proposal to you, hopefully at the next meeting, um, for you to consider. Superintendent? So just uh, briefly, one of the reasons we didn't bring that here and we didn't ask for a vote, some of this information came to us. Like the LCC piece. Like yeah. yesterday. Um, and um, and so that's why you didn't get this too early in the packet, and we didn't want to ask for a vote when you didn't have, we didn't have enough information that, that was critical. But the other piece, uh, and I know Mr. Mangano said it, but I want to emphasize it, is that uh, we're looking at significantly increased usage from both vendors, or both organizations, I should say. And so um, we want to get some feedback on looking at them, you know, perhaps equally, um, and, and provide that some context um, so that we, we can come back taking your feedback into account because the prior meeting was really just looking at the Tritons mm -hmm. uh, and LSC is, well, it's not part of the region, they live in our building, you know, and it is a slightly different scenario, set mm -hmm. of scenarios that we have now than what we had the last time we came to you. So I know we were hoping to get to a resolution place, but we didn't feel like we had new information and we didn't have complete information. So I, I just want to apologize for the delay, but it was we didn't want to push you all to move faster than the information was coming. And this is like the opposite problem from what we had like four years ago. <laughs> Nobody in our pool. Now everybody <laughs> wants to be in our pool. So it's a good problem to have. We just have to find a solution that doesn't, mm -hmm. that sustains the pool into the future. We don't want to obviously put the pool at risk from overuse or anything like that. Okay. Two points. I think you said the this agreement, if there is one, the high school swim team needs will take priority yep. over all other uses. Yep, that's explicit. So for both parties, we have what's called a license agreement that lays out all the, the responsibilities, and that's in both of them, or all our, our license agreements, that and high school teams have priority. The second point, this is a tremendous increase in usage and exposure to liability. Does this have any insurance implications? Yeah, so both parties have to provide um, certificates of liability insurance that are consistent with our coverages in the district. So they both, that we've had our insurance agent provide. Yeah. So your insurance policy will not go up? It go. they have to, we're insured as well, but they have to provide their own certificate of liability insurance. Yeah. Are there other, other questions or, or guidance to Um I guess just in, in terms of what you all are thinking about the ballpark of, uh, of the fee schedule, you know, there's, I think, uh, I mean, my feeling is you certainly want to cover your costs. You know, that's the kind of the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. And then, and then there's a difference between that and what a market rate might be that you could charge in in a, in a regular scenario. Um, but then there's the consideration that you know these are community organizations, these are town organizations, and so you might not want to philosophically charge top dollar, <laughs> even though it might bring in top dollar. So I, I don't have you have you had any initial thoughts about, you know, is this a money-making opportunity? Is that how you're looking at it? Or is this, a, you're looking to break even and, and do, do a good deed? You want to start? start? Yeah, I'll start. So uh, I think you're right, and, and I agree with what you're framing. Uh, so I think uh, I have three thoughts. One is that we're not looking to make money, but we are looking to have a significant amount in the reserve, of, as a reserve fund so that invariably if there's increased usage, have wear and tear, that we actually have funds to pay for the impact of that wear and tear. And it's not something that you can predict down to the penny because you don't exactly know what it's going to look like. But we are looking to, inc if we're going to have this much usage, we do want to have a fund that kind of um, then proportionally increases over time so that we maintain what is now a really, you know, high quality pool, which wasn't always the case. We had a lot of problems. We put money into it. 
So that's, that's the first point I want to have. I think the second is um, that there's, um, it's hard to quantify fully. Um, on the weekends, if there's no custodian there and we have to hire a custodian to be there, that's easy to quantify during the week. No matter how well these groups clean up for themselves, there still is an additional load on custodians. So even if they're already working and we don't, we're not hiring additional custodial support, it has an impact on you know the operation of the building. So that's where I think we struggle with um, philosophically with how to quantify that because it's not like we're hiring someone else except that person now has more responsibilities and we don't really need another full person. But how do you actually make what's the calculus of that is a challenge. So I think what me and Mr. Gano and you could you know jump in, Sean. Um, sorry, I'm being long-winded. Our thinking is, can we uh, make a, you know, a rate that is defensible, that adds to the balance that we have, but also can provide us the necessary support so that um, our school, our middle school, is well maintained in, in addition to the pool, um, and we're being fair to our you know, community organizations. And that's at least our philosophy of how to make this all work, to, to do look at so much usage. We may not want to keep the $30 per hour, but we don't want to go too low where we're actually having a negative impact on the school. Yeah, and, and I'll just build off uh, your first point. So when we didn't have anybody in the pool, the only re reason we were able to sustain the pool and provide all the chemicals and keep it going without any impact on the general fund was because we had such a large reserve from prior decades when the pool was heavily used, we were able to use that. Um, that was really the impetus for why we started getting people back in the pool because it got low. <laughs> um, so I think we do want to build that reserve a for the capital improvements. You know, we just uh, recently we cleaned all the grout and kind of repolished everything. We bought a new heating system. Um, that those things have to be done every you know five to ten years, um, at least on the the grout piece of it. Um, so I think that's again we want to build that pool reserve for those types of things so that we can keep it going long to the future because the pool's as old as the building I think. So it's you know talking sixty year old pool, large pool. So any other any other questions or comments? Oh hi. <laughs> I understand that tonight's conversation is about the pool, but I want us to also be open and keep in mind that there are other agencies that have been looking to use our facilities. I would like the conversation to open more widely to those other agencies that work with our students because they've asked the question about facilities use. Mm -hmm. So whatever our decision may be about the pool, I want us to expand it and expand our thoughts to thinking about the other um, facilities too. Um, so this is less about financing, but more about the idea of having this calendar. So um, it seems like we want to make sure we're building in a time when people can come and go. I'm just thinking if we book it too closely so that the Tritons are leaving at the same time as small children who are mm -hmm. doing lessons. Like, I'm sure somebody's <coughs> thinking about this, but the, the flow of people in and out and the popula different populations who are affiliated with each of these mm -hmm. groups, it seems... Like we should make sure that we don't maximize to the point where we're getting right. yeah. overcrowded in the locker rooms and things like that. So they currently, even this past year, they sort of had that tight transition. Um, but I haven't heard any issues from LCC. Okay. And LCC's first. I haven't heard any issues with like kind of being overwhelmed with people coming in. But I'll check when I meet with them just yeah, to make sure that's. Yeah, something I was thinking about if you're in yeah. there with small children. And it's like yeah, especially the, lock, the locker room <laughs> yeah, transitions exactly. and things like that. Yeah. So uh, I guess my, my, my comment would just be that I, I like the fact that you raised the question of how do you build in, what's the, actually I think I'll, I'll take the assistant superintendent's frame first. What's our philosophy mm -hmm. towards use, um, opening our facilities and how do we think about pricing in, in, that, in that regard? And I think that the idea that it has to be budget neutral in terms of covering costs, I think including some wiggle room mm -hmm. for the idea that you can't completely anticipate, you know, the need for custodians or whatever it is, or cleaning up, you know, whatever the situation is. The reality is we know there's got to be some sort of fudge factor mm -hmm. in in the number that allows for the possibility that things over time are going to even out at costs at a slightly higher level than you anticipated initially. And if that's not true, you can adjust after a year or two and go down, go downwards. Um, one. Um, two, I think the idea that we would also build in some conception around replenishment of our capital or of our facilities into the pricing mm -hmm. also makes enormous sense. And I'm saying this precisely because of, of what Ms. Cunningham was saying, that 
you can you can you can now port those those concepts from this discussion into any other discussion you're doing. Um, the, the challenge is getting good numbers and figuring mm -hmm. out what's what's a reliable basis. Knowing that if you can always if you charge too much, you can always scale back. Mm -hmm. If you charge too little, it can be really challenging <laughs> to increase prices once you get the sticker price in yeah. there. And so when I'm when I'm thinking about it in terms of a future item. I'm thinking about it in those terms. Mm -hmm. What is there? Is there a statement? And I guess this actually echoes Mr. Downing said earlier. Is there, in fact, a philosophy around how we're opening these facilities up and making yeah. them available um, from from that perspective? And then, um, you know, show the numbers that can show that we're being conservative in how we're doing the pricing. Once once we've accomplished those objectives, because we're a public facility, and we're this is a public good we're trying to offer people and, and participate in. The idea that um, a nonprofit, I guess I distinguish that from a for profit, yeah. but the idea that a nonprofit can benefit from it at a reasonable at a reasonable price point price point that's discounted off of the private sector doesn't bother me at all, mm -hmm. as long as you can assure taxpayers and your neighbors that we're not actually unintentionally subsidizing the activity without expressly making the decision to do so yeah. in some way. So Serena? I agree with what you said, but in the entire discussion, we should remember this is a school first and a community center second. There, second, it's not a community center; it's a school. Yeah, I don't think anyone was actually contradicting yeah. your, your observation earlier. What I, I what I heard question that there are a lot of organizations interested in using our facilities. This is, can't be a community center. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I've been in touch with Mike and, and uh, our facility director Rupert about is that. Aside from the pool, which is sort of an emergency thing that popped up because of the additional request, we do want to review our facility use procedures. Um, both the, the guidelines are on the website that have a fee schedule, but that definitely needs to be reviewed and updated. Um, and then there's some like procedures online as well, which aren't policy, but they're just some procedures that support that um, sort of guidelines. So both of those need to be reviewed sort of with what everybody said um, in addition to the, the pool. And the pool needs to be included because the pool is not even part of that right now. The pool is separate from that. We got to move on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that toward you. No, no. I meant toward. I thank all of you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your time. Okay. Uh, I need a two-minute recess if it's okay. All right. Okay. okay. They use a lot of our facilities. <laughs> How many courses are you taking this semester? Um, so I'm taking like four. Uh huh. That's a heavy load. Yeah, I think it was yeah. for grad student. Usually they take about like two or three. Right. I'm just taking like one because I'm going to head on the band here. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So I'm doing some review stuff with the mechanics right now. Mm -hmm. What building are you all in? Um, so I basically live in Marston Hall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, I, uh, I, I missed you over there. I was actually 
really wanting to conclude that item so I could take a <laughs> recess. And so, so I'm fixated on getting the committee to speak oh, and, and wrap up. I didn't take offense. <laughs> no, I just, I was, I was really a tunnel vision. I was going to say, if you didn't notice me, I was going to say something. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I decided not to turn over the chair to Ms. McDonald for the final item on the agenda. I thought I could just do that, and then I could come back, I could go uptown and get some ice cream and come back and see how things were going. But I decided not to. I thought, Parts oh. is still open. Might as well. <laughs> <laughs> Sun's still up. You'd be going there right there with you. Yeah, every that's, time that's you give him the option, you'd be like, is Bart's open? You know? He, you ever been to Flavors of Cook Farm? Of course. Yeah. It's so good. That's really good ice cream. There's a, there's a um, what road is that, anyways? Maple, isn't it? Maple? Yeah. yeah um, going towards like Atkins and towards, you know, um, the mountain range. Um, yeah, if you're in Target and, and you go off the road that's behind Target. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you just keep right. going. Okay. Keep going. Like, go through two, um, two stop signs. The, uh, you'll, and you'll, you'll what happen is you'll start driving through a working dairy farm oh. in which there's like barns and cows on both sides of the road. Mm -hmm. And then there's like a little, you know, little stand mm -hmm. that you can, they pull into. And uh, if you want to like stare at the cows, you can stare at the cows, including little baby calves and stuff. Um, but if you go inside, they sell uh, milk, butter, eggs, and homemade ice cream. That's absolutely spectacular. Nice. It's one of the best ice creams in the world. Yeah. And they have yeah. apparently sandwiches and stoops and stuff like that yeah. too. Mac and cheese. I, I myself am a. Uh, yeah. anyway, the kids called it the cow place. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like how often do you see cows and stuff like that? It's totally awesome. <laughs> My dad was a dairy rat. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like he was. Rat as Why is that? Rachel is the best. I think that's awesome. It was such a hard job. Oh, I'm sure. Well, <laughs> it's funny. Actually, my mom grew up on a working farm, and she has she loves farms, but she has a different perspective on sort of the bucolic charm of them. Like, don't get her on chickens. Mr. Medina, we're gonna. No, it's okay. I was just gonna say we're gonna get started. Uh, if Amherst Media is ready. Uh, we're going to resume. So I think that's, I'm going to take that as a yes. Um, so we're back from our recess of the Amherst Pollen Regional School Committee. Uh, and the next item on our agenda is uh, item D, review of policies related to harassment. And as this is introduced, as review current external policies that determine that the policy subcommittee should revise current policies related to harassment and protected groups. This is a discussion, but one of the outcomes of the discussion could be, if the committee is interested, is that this topic could be referred to the policy subcommittee um, for action. And, um, you know, just as, as an introduction to this topic, um, and, and there may be a broader um, framework that the superintendent um, or the assistant superintendent want to place on this, but I would, I would just say that one of the gaps that we, has become apparent um, to a few of us is that um, we have existing policies on a variety of forms of harassment when it comes to students engaging with other students, staff engaging with students, and staff engaging with each other. Um, but we don't have, uh, not limited to this, we don't actually have any approach or policy related to how the public engages uh, with either with the staff and the, the, school, the school community, broadly speaking. And we either either on site or electronically or otherwise, and um, the superintendent I'm sure will talk about this further. But there was a particularly significant um, issue that came up in uh, the Pelham School District last year, right? Last year, uh, in which this topic again about how to how do we even understand, or and how do we approach supporting staff um, to have an environment, a workplace that uh, feels safe, comfortable, supportive. If you look at the value statement that was in your packet from our district, my guess is everyone, I'm hoping, but I'd guess everyone agrees with all the value statements in there that are very positive ones. Um, and they're talking about going beyond sort of a baseline of your sort of minimally safe 
to it's actually a nurturing, supportive, and uh, community that reflects positive values more broadly. And so that became an issue in Pelham. I think for um, leadership in the district, individual staff members, as well as also our school committee, there's also, and this particularly becomes relevant when you're talking about the superintendent, other public facing officials in, this, in, this, in the school committee, um, there's an acute challenge around how to balance the need and desire to receive feedback from the public and get, um, the reality is, if somebody comes to us and they have a concern over how either an individual uh, within in the employee of the district, including the superintendent, um, or us as a committee setting budgets and other decisions, uh, they're likely if they come up to us um, pro and screw up the courage to stand at the microphone to um, be in a position where they have very strong opinions about what they're stating. So the reality is whether it's via email or, or in person, there, there's no way around the fact that if you're in a public facing job, um, there's going to be a lot of criticism. Some of it's gonna be expressed in ways that people might wish in hindsight they hadn't said. And that's the nature of the business because the reality is, and there's obviously, I mean, I'm not an attorney, but we've, we've looked at this enough. I think other people have looked at this enough to know that in, in the public realm in general, um, there's, there's a built-in structural legal bias in favor of speech and in favor of the ability of people to redress government, to say what's on their mind and to speak. And so that's well established. And I think a lot of what we've been trying to do the last few years, at least while I've been here, I'm not saying not before, but I'm just saying I've only been here three years. Uh, and during those three years, I think we've tried to set a tone of transparency. Uh, we've tried to think of different modalities of how to engage the public and listen. Um, and so we've tried to walk the walk. We can always improve doing that. And I'm just I'm framing that out as a principle because when we engage in the discussion around how we engage the public and what policies or rules are set up around it, the natural counterpoint to um, a concern over some of the speech or some of the behavior or actions that might negatively affect staff or the leadership, including the school committee, is, is going to be saying, well, you know, how, do you, how do you know that what you're doing shouldn't be just purely protected speech? I mean, you'd never, and as we all know, you never get into situations where you strain speech. As a matter of fact, the Superior Court decision regarding the Natick School Committee um, last year said, um, in fact, someone can get up and come before you in public comment and say all sorts of things, some of which can end up being actionable on the party who says it, but you don't, you can't restrain the speech in advance. You can't silence the speech in advance. So I say that, I say that as a framework because the alternative circumstance can I think also confront, yourself, can confront us, and I think in fact over the last year has confronted us as a school district where um, you have patterned behavior of speech and recurrent speech uh, and other actions coming before um, both line staff, supervisory staff, administrators, senior leadership in the district, uh, and uh, members of the school committee that um, s seems to push the uh, limits of what should be considered um, fair and reasonable, not as speech per se, but as a pattern of behavior that um, conceivably could, could constitute harassment or bullying. I say that because if you look in our packet, we had a number of things in here around that of other states that have adopted policies uh, on the general public that talk about defining harassment and bullying. Um, and so the reason why this topic is right and coming up is because of the fact that we, just, we realized and sort of wrestled with, and I'm just speaking for myself, I wrestled with this, this past summer how do you provide an environment in which the staff is obviously held accountable, obviously responsible to the public, obviously is accountable to their peers, but at the same time, when they show up to the office, when they open their email, when they do their job, they, they feel like the condition of their employment is naturally conducive to a positive environment that feels progressive in the sense of uh, professionally developmental and supportive, and where criticism is organized in a way that's designed to elicit the best organizational outcome, and outcomes for families and students and staff, right? And the truth is we don't have 
a policy or tool that allows us to guide us in figuring out how to do that. And so the, the discussion that came to us here is figuring out how to do that. Now, everything I just said, I'll be honest with you, has been said hopefully fairly, hopefully reasonably, but also in a fairly bloodless um, language. Part of that is because of this balance point that we're talking about where we have to recognize our responsibility to accept criticism and understand that it probably the trips, meaning the, the, the tripwire of where you go from um, acceptable public comment to something that we can consider abusive, um, the bias is always going to be in favor of speech. The bias is always going to be in favor of free speech. And so figuring out how to do that is hard on the one hand. On the other hand, and I'm just going to say this once, um, if you looked at the totality of, of the emails, just in volume that we've been getting, but also the ways in which the language of those emails um, disparately um, target a variety of individuals from, again, line staff to supervisors to administrators, the senior administrators, school committee members, um, it, there is every reason for people who are our colleagues or who work for us as a school committee to feel uh, insecure, angry, anxious, perhaps even to the point where they might consider leaving and going to another district to work or leaving the employee. Those risks are real and they exist and they're a fact. They're not, that's not even open to debate. That what I just said is a fact. And so um, we don't have the tools right now to effectively deal with this. And we've got to figure out whether we as a committee want to engage in finding those tools, knowing that if we develop such a policy and understood what the flow down implications of the process and any remedy that would exist within the tools, that then they would be implemented on a going forward basis. So I'm going to leave it at, I know that was like a 10 minute introduction, but still a 15 minute introduction, but I'm still going to leave it at that and um, open up for the superintendent and the assistant superintendent to offer their framing and other thoughts um, but honestly, because I know, whether it's you or your colleagues, that you, you're living this, I thought it was important for me to say first that at least as chair of the committee, I'm, I'm taking this very seriously and want to work collaboratively in the framework that I just, uh, just expressed to be very supportive of staff and colleagues um, while also keeping true to those pillars of public engagement and openness that we describe as being our values. So, please. Okay, yeah. So, um, just a little framing. As, as the chair said, this is an issue that came to public comment last year. And Pelham, I'm looking at Mr. Menino because um, he was at that meeting. Um, and uh, we heard from some staff members based on um, dialogue between uh, community members of the public uh, that in, in that instance wasn't actually directed at them, at staff members. But for them, what they shared is it created a work environment that, that didn't feel safe and, and they weren't referring to physical safety and to be really clear mm -hmm. uh, but that uh, they expect to go to work and not hear uh, the language they heard that day um, it impacted them greatly and mr Reno, is that a fair summary of yes and so the pelham school committee uh, requested that i meet with the staff members and and i did so and uh, one of the um and I thought the principal, and I said this in Pelham, and I'll say it here, I thought the principal responded very appropriately uh, and, and met that balance that, that you described. And what I think was disquieting for, for us was that when we went to policy, we didn't actually have a place, a leg to stand on, actually, to make a judgment. So we did the thing that we felt like was the right thing to support staff members. Um, I think it was done sensitively in terms of follow-up. Um, but it, it, if challenged, there wasn't a great place to go to say, oh, actually, this policy was violated. We, did, we didn't have that. It's not in the, in the, in the book. And so Pelham School Committee talked about this last week. They are choosing to move forward, you know, and, and perhaps they'll collaborate if this committee wants to, or perhaps not. But one of the things the chair of the Pelham School Committee and I talked about is um, what do other places do on this issue? Amherst is not, we, we joke about being unique, and maybe there's some truth to that in some ways, but um, this issue is a broader issue uh, of staff, workplace safety. And if you read the paper this morning, uh, not our local rep, but a local rep in, in the general area is proposing language at the state house actually around it. And I think it includes language um, uh, from Representative Sebadosa 
um, to how to address language uh, to prevent verbal or physical conduct that quote creates an intimidating, hostile, offensive, or other otherwise untenable workplace environment. Um, and so I think just broadening the scope I think is helpful because it's not yes you know we may have an acute issue uh, or acute issues uh, in multiple districts, but I think the broader conversation about workplace safety and workplace environment is is really where for me is the most important thing. And again, the purpose of this agenda topic is to raise an issue that is currently affecting staff members um, and discuss whether this matter should be referred or how it should be referred to the policy subcommittee, um, not to come up with a policy in and of itself. But the Pelham uh, School Committee Chair and I uh, reached out to, um, actually on her behalf I did, to the Massachusetts Association of School Committees just to say, you know, what are other places doing? And uh, she put out a, a feeler actually to a nat her national network of school committees and school boards associations. And so within the packet, which was in the Pelham packet as well, as a couple other examples of states, how they approach this issue with their model policies. Um, and I think, um, I think in particular, I think the most instructive one is the, the last one in your packet, it's NCSBA, which is North Carolina School Boards Associations. And if people want to actually like, I'd like to, Read from there more yes. than actually talk about um, other things. I should talk about because I think the chair has <coughs> much of that. So if you're on, if you look at page two of ten, there there's a footnote at the at the bottom, and that's actually the the crux of the matter for me. And uh, essentially, what it says is that a policy prohibiting har harassment bullying is required, and, and so that's really in that section one above. So if you look at harassment bullying. 2A1, places a student or school employee in actual or reasonable fear of harm to his or her person or damage to his or her property. In the Pelham situation, that was actually the core principle of uh, that wasn't met. And it was really uh, unsatisfactory to staff when I met with them, who, again, were incredibly professional in how they approached this, that that is essentially our standard in talking to our legal counsel right now based on our policy is that people have to, you know, if that got tripped, there would be other actions that me as the superintendent, the principal could take. And so the interesting thing about the footnote is the second sentence to me, this policy adopts a broader definition of harassment bullying than is required by their, gen their general laws, which are very similar to Massachusetts, which does not include conduct that creates a hostile environment by adversely altering the conditions of an employee's employment. And then they go on from there. And I think, so the key question for for the committee to consider is kind of on that first tier of if a school employee feels physically unsafe, while it's not in policy, we have mass general law which supersedes policy and you know we have action steps that we can take. It's really about that second piece about the hostile work environment and whether the committee would like to engage on what that looks like to, to understand and actually you know walk in and, and live the tension between how do you define that, uh, what, um, how do you do that without constraining free speech in ways that would be inconsistent with our philosophy. We ourselves, administrators, uh, both ourselves and for our staff, we expect, um, and it's not just like a hope, it's an expect that all staff members are open to critical feedback as part of our continuous improvement process. So um, I think we have lots of tangible examples, both at the committee level but also at the administrative level, of ideas that came from other places as critiques and have been now integrated into district practice. We are better off for it. You know, we think about, we talked about the hiring process earlier. Mm -hmm. There's definitely critiques um, about our hiring process for many years that weren't acute to one year. We took that feedback and under Ms. Cunningham's leadership, we have significantly adjusted the kind of um, search, the interview and search process. Um, and that's what we do. And that's the expectation we have for all staff. And so how to balance taking authentic critiques that may be framed in ways that are not how one would love them to be framed I think we have to make sure that stays clear, pure, and part of our operations, not just for all the free speech reasons, legal reasons, but that's actually how we get better, right? We can't only listen to feedback that's framed the way we want it to be framed. Um, at the same time, when we get into bullying and harassing behaviors, um, and particularly bias-based behaviors um, and comments, that's where the workplace safety and the harassment and bullying come in. And, and so that's, that's a, um, it's an easy distinction to, uh, feel it's a harder one to identify in, in real life with real scenarios, uh, but I think that's this this footnote for me is the crux of the matter. Is do we want to uh, does the committee rather want to engage in how to do that? Does it want to uh, look at uh, what are models out there like the ones here or other places 
um, and extend you know, beyond physical safety of the employees, uh, as well as perhaps school committee members, to a broader definition of, of what that means. Um, and I was going to say other things, but I think that's actually where I'll leave it. I think Mr. McAdema said yeah. a number of things. I think he said a lot. <laughs> that's very important to have been said. Uh, I look at his, the superintendent's bill number three that talks about diversifying and retaining once we correct it or add to it, retaining staff. And when we look at the things that are being written or stated about the staff, the morale has been um, compromised, right? And I'm not saying, as, as um, Dr. Morris mentioned, that we should always hear great things and how well we're doing. And we should receive that criticism. And there's a point and a limit to how things should be stated, right? So it's encouraging for me to hear that we're thinking and looking at the possibility of um, a policy around this topic. And I know that if and when this does occur, it then can impact staff morale, retention, and all the other things that we talked about, especially with identifying why people are leaving the district. And then I want us to even go a further step and talk about, okay, if there's a violation of our policy, what the result would actually look like. So I don't want us to just put something on paper and say, we have this document that says, don't do this, but I want some tangibles for our staff to say, if there is something that takes place, here's what the district or the school committee has said that they will do as a result of that. It's, inter it's interesting. I'm gonna, uh, I apologize, I'll throw it to everyone else on the committee in a second. But it was interesting when I was reading through the, the examples that were put in the packet, one of the first things that struck me was whether or not there was any articulation of what the potential either remedies or sanctions or other sorts of, or, or even, um, you know, like requiring mediation, like whatever it is, it could be any number of kinds of responses. The idea that, it, that if you don't, if you can't articulate what the sort of remedy or response or a corrective action is, then, I mean, what's good, the, what good is the policy? Right. And I think particularly in a situation like this, where you're talking about something where I've already beaten, like I couldn't say more times than I already did, that we're trying to find an appropriate balance where we're respecting free speech and mm -hmm. you know, cr uh, constructive criticism, or even non-constructive <laughs> criticism, <laughs> just criticism, um, with, with this question about what the workplace environment is like and how to support um, staff and the leadership, that if you, if you don't take that next step of translating it into what the remedies are, then it becomes meaningless because it means whenever you actually try to use the policy, everyone's first thought is, "Oh my God, we've never given any thought to how to implement this." And we don't. And, and here's the key point: we don't know what's legal, what's best practice, what's legal, who should be the responsible parties, how do you keep it conf. I mean, I know we have some a lot of experience keeping things confidential, but I'm just saying because we're talking about something that would involve theoretically a member of the public who's not subject to the normal sort of personnel and HR rules. Um, how do you do that? How do you do that appropriately, right? If you don't think about those things in advance, and more importantly, you don't think about them when you're not thinking about like a particular case in Pelham, right? right. I mean, not to pick on Pelham, but you, you can't be doing it framing out a particular instance or circumstance. Bless it needs to be, bless you, it needs to be, it needs to be something that could apply in any situation, mm -hmm. even if it allows for continuous improvement and learning. Right. Um, so I'm sorry to throw all that out, but I mean, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly, and that even means, if the, in my view, if the policy subcommittee wanted to, if the committee wanted to engage in this, and the policy subcommittee wanted to engage in this, I think there needs to be some dialogue between the committee and the administration while we're developing it, so we can actually practically put forward not just the policy, but also what's a view towards implementation steps that come almost together, mm -hmm. at least in some framing. So I'm, this is like a big, I mean, I know the committee knows this, and you've been getting emails too, this is like a really big deal topic. So I apologize I'm going off on it like this, but this is like a really, really important topic for our district uh, to, to confront and deal with in a way that's really constructive, but is also meaningful. Is it nice? Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think that given the, the severity of the situation that you've described, um, and I think that you know what the superintendent has described with the the issue in Pelham last year, that this topic rises to the level of attention for the entire committee. Um, 
I think, you know, personally, I, I would appreciate probably having the policy, policy subcommittee take a close look at some language uh, and making some recommendations to the full committee. But I, I think that this requires input from, you know, the assistant superintendent, the superintendent, mm -hmm. uh, various administrators, school committee members, you know, everyone seated around this table has been impacted in one way or another um, and will continue to be. Um, so I think that, you know, having a, a process that is clear and transparent that involves, you know, the full committee input uh, and that is done in public is the best approach for something like this. Um, you know, I think someone mentioned before about the potential loss of staff. That is 100% something that I'm constantly thinking about. Uh, you know, the description here and this language from the North Carolina School Board is incredible language, right? Because it talks about that hostile environment uh, and it talks about how, you know, uh, basically the harassment or the bullying, because really that's what we're talking mm -hmm. about, that the conduct is objectively severe or pervasive enough that a reasonable person would agree that it is harassment or bullying. And that signals to me the degree of engagement um, that has been happening, right? There's, you know, it's, it's anyone, any reasonable person who would look at the volume of, of messages, the, you know, uh, the posts that have been posted online, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of, of things that go above and beyond the usual kinds of comments or criticisms that we, we receive. And I can say, having sat on this committee now for three and a half years, that you know, I've, I've heard from the community when they're angry about things, right? And, and that's a normal part, and I actually invite that, and we'll sit down and have conversations with people. Um, but when you are receiving a, you know, a level of, of, of rage, really, uh, in you know, messages that are being directed, uh, that we've seen directed to staff and to administrators and to school committee members, there's no degree of conversation or uh, reasonable you know, dialogue that can be expected with something like that. And so I'm hopeful that you know, a policy that we can put together can help address that degree of, of severity and acknowledging that we are all here because we believe in free speech and we think that it's important and we have never taken any steps to try to curtail or stop uh, you know, people from expressing their opinions and their viewpoints on the way that we run our district. Uh, at the same time, there is a level of responsibility that is required when engaging, you know, other human beings that we all expect of each other. And so I hope that any policy that we can come up with reflects that and helps put an end to the hostility and, you know, that, that degree of severity that we're describing right now. Sure. So I, I would agree with, with all of the, the comments from Mr. Donias. Um, my sort of way I, I try and frame this is that you know, if we're going to be looking at a policy to address harass, ha harassment and bullying that leads to a hostile work environment, and yes, I definitely think we should do that, and I think collaborating with Pelham and any other committees that would like to do that is a good idea. Um, I, I think we need to articulate a little more clearly uh, for the public um, exactly what's been going on. Um, we've talked around it and a, a bit, a bit direct, directly on it, but I think... I, I sort of see this as a collaboration between the public and the school committee and administration. And, um, and I think the first, the first logical step in getting to a solution is to, is to identify the problem as specifically as possible. So I think uh, in that sort of fact-finding spirit, uh, I, it, there's, there's two things that, that I would like to see happen. One is I'd like to uh, hear from the superintendent and assistant superintendent a little more specifically, what, to what degree is this a current issue for you and your staff? Uh, and, and what is the nature and extent of, of this, this harassment, uh, including, we've, we've, we've heard people mention emails, does this include phone calls, uh, actions at formal meetings, informal encounters, public records requests, uh, other forms of communication? You know, what, what, what is the nature of this problem? So that's, that's one. This, the, the second is, I, th I think the school, are, uh, we as a committee can share with the public uh, in a bit more direct detail, what, what we've observed happening for the past year and a half, because this has been a long process that we have observed, and and what we've been seeing is, is not normal. Like we're we're not talking about mainline, someone pops off and loses their cool. This is this is abnormal activity that we have been 
seeing it. What I'm specifically referring to is this, this, and it's already been mentioned, the sustained high volume of direct personal criticism, not policy, cri personal criticisms and accusations of wrongdoing through, through email that we've seen, but also through public internet and social media channels that have targeted, but have not been limited to the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, the finance director, the special ed director, the assistant special ed director, the high school principal, the middle school principal, and numerous teachers and staff and multiple individuals on this committee. And that, that's, an, that's an incomplete list that we've observed. And again, to be clear, we're not talking about strongly worded criticism or even passionate emotion, which I completely agree with Ms. Ordonia is we should totally welcome, and that's part of the nature of what we do here. But, but these are personal criticisms that when you, they're combined with the accusations in this extreme high volume aggregate that we've observed can be reasonably constituted as intimidation, bullying, or harassment. And, and not only do our staff not deserve that, but when I hear from our assistant superintendent that morale has been compromised, and, and when I read some of the specific examples of what I, in my view, are vile personal criticisms, it, it really concerns me. And, and I don't know what the solution is, but I do think in order to get there, it has to be a collaboration between the school committee, the public, and, and the administration. Uh, and the, the reason we're engaging on this difficult topic is because we do want to create and maintain that safe environment for our teachers and staff. Sweden? I encourage you to formulate a policy if for no other reason to find how difficult it will be. Uh, these emails make me sick to my stomach. They raise questions of fact that I can't begin to address. Uh, they accuse certain staff members of doing something. I don't know whether they did them. <laughs> uh, uh, what are the consequences on a member of the public uh, violating the, the policy? I can't begin to visualize a formulation of a consequence that we can measure out. But I think it's important that the community knows that we know that it's a problem and that we're trying to fashion a, a remedy, but uh, what is the solution except just, just to endure? Uh, harsh language, the presidential contenders <laughs> say things that are harsh and demeaning. Uh, what is the consequence? I th I, so um, I'm not, and I'm not trying to directly debate or respond to what you're saying, but one of I think one of the things which is challenging is, uh, and I, I, I intentionally wasn't being specific earlier, a to frame out the issue, so I think it's important to, and b because the challenge of this is this is an issue that's acutely personal for those people it's affected, oh, and I did not feel like I'm just saying this openly. I don't feel like I have the authority to essentially put people on the spot about the content of what they've experienced and the content of how that might affect them or how they should feel about being attacked in their identity, their person, um, and their character. And that's happened to multiple people. I've seen the emails. Uh, and, so, and so it's also not hard to find, right? It's actually documented uh, in our servers. Um, but it is again the challenge of the topic is that you you want you want to give agency to people to speak for themselves and empower themselves in defending themselves. You don't want to be in a position where you're essentially um, someone has to relive a trauma twice, um, first time by having the experience, second time by having it named publicly, even if somebody thinks they're trying to be helpful. Um, although interestingly enough, Mr. Menino. Uh, that giving agency to people is in fact an important part of morale building. If you have a process that allows someone to call something by its name, by their perception, come forward and file and document and have responsible parties who are willing to take it seriously and evaluate the claim in a spirit that's supportive, that actually is itself important. The second thing I'd say is, and I'm not trying to get into, we, we need to look into this if we're going to look into this, but the second thing you can do is, particularly if you're talking about um, people who work for the district, it's harder for school committee members, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. but because we're elected officials. But for people who work for the district, um, if there's a member of the public who's engaging in 
repeated pattern of, of hostile communication, then the superintendent has the ability to reassign that chain of communication in a way that um, removes the individual who's being targeted from that chain of communication. If you think about it in terms of, oh, well, that means you're preventing me from talking to the district. It's like, no, no, you're not. I'm just changing the person who's doing it. For the individual who's no longer being, as they perceive it, harassed or bullied, on the other hand, that's made every difference in the world yeah. because they're no longer being harassed or bullied, right? It doesn't solve the whole global problem, but the reality is what we have here is a situation that can feel global, but is, is actually composed of the microdemic experiences of dozens of individuals when they come to work of a morning, when they open up their email, when, they're answer, they look, when they look to see what am I approaching this day, each one of those individuals and the work environment they have and the supportiveness they feel, their experience is critical. And so some of the tools we might be able to develop might be more targeted towards the circumstance of different kinds of personnel or staff. Um, I think beyond that, we need to be guided by the laws to whether or not there are other remedies that would actually prevent people from, depending on their behavior, coming onto school property or otherwise engaging um, publicly. But again, I want to say because we think the circumstances, I think we'd say two things. One, the general sentiment is the circumstances we're experiencing now probably rise to the test. Some would say certainly, but I'm just simply saying we're not, we're not picking this out of thin air shallowly. There's a big deal thing going on. And we're trying to figure out how do we develop the appropriate tools that could be genuinely responsive. I, I just agree. Gave, I just gave you an example of how we, we should might do something. Individual employee. So we've got to look for that. I agree. Sorry, right, Mr. Potch. Yeah, um, I, I think we're experiencing a situation that's been aggravate, aggravated um, by changes in technology. I don't believe that this is merely a problem that's existed for a year and a half. Um, I think this kind of uh, various levels of character assassination have persisted in this community for a long, long time. Um, they now are capable of communicating those efforts via um, social media. But to assume that they didn't exist prior to this current age, I think is a serious mistake. Um, it says something about um, the degree to which people have, in my judgment, have mistake mistakenly, seriously mistakenly, the true um, meaning, if you will, at least in our society legally and constitutionally, the meaning of free speech. And free speech is something that we've always struggled with trying to both define and curb. Um, I think we should develop a policy. I, I unfortunately, in my own personal experience, and we're not going to get rid of this kind of um, really repugnant and despicable language used to characterize people, whether they're staff or not. Uh, it's endemic to a broader society than Amherst. And um, if we can create a policy which at least minimizes it to some extent, all well and good. But there's something, um, well, I, I, there's something very rotten in public discourse these days. Um, and um, I think that's what people are experiencing. But to assume that it's just now, I think it's a serious mistake. So I want to go around the committee for any final thoughts people have on this topic, as well as um, I'm starting to hear some consensus from those people who've spoken that we should do, some, do something to develop or advance developing a policy. But I just want to make sure people have a chance to, um, if they have any comments or questions or other thoughts, that they're able to do that. So. Sure. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but some of them have already been stated by others. So. Um, first, I want to start with, and also Allison and I are both members of the policy subcommittee, she's the chair, but it feels like a lot to put on the policy subcommittee <laughs> to solve this problem. Um, and if we do, and I, I'm happy to read policies, I'm happy to try and draft some and be um, involved in getting into the nitty gritty of this, but I, I would want the full engagement of 
HR here, um, Ms. Cunningham, potentially, maybe others, and also potentially counsel, just because we're talking about this really fine line, and if we get it wrong, it's just going to feed the, the, the flames of what's happening, I feel like, in mm -hmm. terms of if we're perceived as trying to quash criticism in this community in particular, I think we could be um, just, we're walking on a razor's edge when it comes to crafting a policy. So I, I'm happy to, to take a lead as a member of the policy mm -hmm. subcommittee, but I think we'd want to do so with, with the engagement of others outside of that, because it's just, I guess, four of us. But um, the other thing is, I, I think there is value, even if the policy doesn't necessarily give us new tools to deal with this. I think what you said before um, about just being able to name it and acknowledge that this thing that's happening to me when I open my inbox, it's, it is, um, it, you know, it, it sounds like what's in this policy. <laughs> and so, you know, for, for an employee to be able to name it and then be able to feel like there's something wrong here and I have a and this is how I can go about addressing it. And, and maybe it's not gonna solve the problem completely, but I, I think we need to be able to validate people's experiences and give them the support that they need to cope with them. So one of the things that I think is frustrating is that a lot of individuals are experiencing this. Um, and so it'd be interesting to understand how, if at all, they're gaining support from each other, because we're not alone in it, but it kind of, and I can only speak as my experience is receiving these emails as a school committee member, but sometimes it feels really alone because you're alone read opening this inbox and you're like, am I the only one who's having this reaction to this? Is there, you know, um, and to hear that it's part of a much, much bigger problem is in some ways disheartening, but it's also helpful to know that there are other people going through the same experience and we might have some ability to deal with it by acknowledging that and finding out how other people are dealing with it. I don't know if that makes sense to others, but um, I think the other question that I think would be useful is to talk about, you know, um, Mr. Dumbling was talking about the specifics of what's been happening, but I think looking, you know, on one of the policies here, it says that harassment um, it defines as something that substantially disrupts the orderly operation of the school. So I'm concerned about the effects on employees, but I'm also concerned about the effects on students, and if we're spending significant resources, either time, um, or cost if we're responding to, um, you know, requests for information, all of these things, you know, just the energy we're spending right now, this has cost us not talking about something else. We're, we're talking about um, this, this. So I think that would be really helpful in communicating to the public or just documenting in some way um, what's going on. So thank you. Ms. McDonald? I won't even bother. Um, I, I don't really have anything to add. Everybody has spoken very eloquently and and um, and I and I think well, the and echoed a lot of my my same thoughts. Um, I I do agree with what um, you both have said about this. Is this as with any policy, it needs to be written by the entire, by the full committee and with the full committee's input, with council input. We're not, none of us are attorneys on the policy subcommittee. Um, and and so I, I wholeheartedly support that. I, I will offer and ask the question, somebody has to do the drafting. Um, you know, we can't sit here all together writing. So I don't know what process might work and maybe um, others that have been around you know around on the school committee for longer than I have might have ideas there but I do agree that this is very very important something that we should address with with some sense of urgency and how we want to do that I think is the next question sure. so um, uh, I, th I think we framed it out as going to the policy subcommittee because we're talking about a policy mm -hmm. so, so I think if we didn't start there we were doing a disservice somehow to the conversation um, because uh, by one wonderful coincidence, uh, the vice chair of the regional school committee happens to be the chair of the policy subcommittee. Um, my recommendation, and others can be involved as long as it doesn't ma make a quorum. Um, but and I, I guess I'd encourage that if people want to be. But um, what I would suggest that we do as an af as an after action after this meeting is that um, we meet and sit down with the superintendent and the assistant superintendent. Uh, and potentially the, our, our attorney 
and sort of try to start mapping out how we can take next steps and approach it in a way that respects the position of the subcommittee. I think we have a policy that actually says that these policies have to go through that committee. Um, so not to sound funny about this, but that can either be literally something being generated by that committee or there could be a procedural element of it being you know, largely crafted and then that committee could meet and vote or whatever. Or we could frankly suspend our rules at some point with a vote that formally adopts that. But I want to make sure we don't do something like this and somebody looks at it and says, well, you didn't even follow your own, you know, your own committee rules. Um, so we'll have to figure that out. Um, so, um, and, and obvi obviously, I think the comments that are being made that it needs to be sort of a working group or team that includes uh, the assistant superintendent, not in our role as the, our head of HR, um, makes tremendous sense. So, um, and there may be others, in other words, that the superintendent or Ms. Cunningham think of that would be involved in the administrative side that if you think of them, great. You know what I mean? That we're trying to make this an effective working group, not, not um, I don't know, just name parties. Um, there, you, I guess if there are members of the committee that would like to be involved in this, beyond at this I'm sorry let me back up the whole committee is going to be involved in this I'm saying in terms of the initial cogitating and getting together if there are other people who'd like to be involved in the committee you can either let us know now or you can let us know after this meeting I don't really care as long if we reach once we reach four that group is capped <laughs> as you could imagine um, does that sound like a reasonable plan? Since we've already, since everyone has expressed a desire to try to move forward on this topic, um, then we're going to move forward on this topic. We don't need to vote to do that. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I just want to come back to. Um, there were disparate comments, but I'm connecting them. So a comment Mr. Deming made about um, kind of identifying uh, more fully for the committee. Um, what emails are coming in, the you know, content quality. And then Ms. Spitzer's comment about, you know, feeling, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't capture language, but it was isolated or alone as you're reading them. And I think one of the challenges that, that we face is because of the nature of the emails, um, I guess I struggle with, there's a lot of people's rights involved, privacy rights, um, and what I can share with the committee versus, I mean, certainly it's all public recordable, um, and I'm aware of that, but, um, that's, I think, where I struggle with it, and I'm just being very transparent that, that um, I feel awkward having information or seeing emails that I'm not sharing with the full committee because um, it's pertinent, but at the same time, I have to respect privacy rights of people who are on them, and, and, and so I don't know how to reconcile that. I'll do some thinking about it, and ideas would be helpful. Public records is a little cleaner, and I can share, you know, have that data, but maybe I'll share it uh, more fully in an email. Um, um, this week, just so that you at least have that one, because it's less um, less personal in nature, but certainly no less uh, impactful in terms of the operations of the district. Um, but I think, you know, I want to acknowledge both of those points and say that I'm struggling myself on how to, uh, what people's right to privacy is and versus making sure the committee has enough pertinent information to understand um, the topic that we're talking about. Um, and so, again, ideas, and it doesn't have to be right now, but ideas that people might generate would be, would be great, but um, it is uh, a real conflict for me. Um, and I don't mean just a real conflict how to do, but it's also a real conflict of how do you all have relevant information to consider, um, and um, I'm not at resolution yet um, on how to approach that, but I want to actually question. voice that. Just yeah. in sheer numbers, do you yeah. have a sense of... Um, how many emails, how many people have been, don't, don't, you don't even need to describe any details to it. Right. But how many, I mean, if there's something like that, how many public records requests, yeah. have there been a lot of them? Sure. I mean, what are we looking at? I mean, what are we looking at here? So, um, By the way, just for the public's information, I already know the answer in general terms. <laughs> and the answer yeah. is, it's a lot. But, yeah. my point, but my point is, because we're doing this in public, the only element, there's, there are many things about what Mr. Dunning and Ms. Spitzer said, it made enormous sense. But, um, but the challenge we have beyond that right. is apart from whatever we think, there's a public out there that's, that's now some people are going to be listening to all this. Right. And they're going to be saying, I don't really get this. Are you talking about like, you know, 20 emails or something? Right. But some of them are really nasty or, I mean, or what? I mean, what are you talking about? 
Yeah, so in the last, if you look at like roughly the last 75 business days, so roughly three months, um, we've received 86, this is total, um, 86 public records requests from a total of five individuals or organizations, because sometimes it comes from an organization. So we preserved, received 82, um, sometimes they're couched in multiple ones in the same email, and that's true for all of these requesters, but um, 82 from uh, one party and one each from four other parties. Um, and just for scale, you know, Wellesley, um, you know, felt like it was excessive and, and challenged when they had 200 over the course of five years. Um, so we're slated to be 200 in the course of five months at this pace, or a little less. My math's a little off on that. Um, less than a year for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, something that I'll come back to is, is some communities have had to add staffing to manage that, and it's not just the person who receives the requests, that the requests require someone else to be gathering data. So a typical request would be emails, it involves IS, it involves someone to look if there's any redactions needed, or a request might be something that's in the business office or the human resources office. Um, so the person who is the receiver of the request is responsible for filling it, but often has to rely on others for data. Um, so um, that's one thing that's objective, that's clean, that I can say that doesn't you know, compromise anybody's sense of privacy. Um, okay. So there's one data point. Mr. Fox, and we probably need to move on relatively soon, but Mr. Rogers. Just really quickly, um, there was a time when blogs in town were numerous and contained really brutal information or innuendo and attacks on people, including the entire school committee at times. Um, so I, I think we need to be careful. We're not going to solve this problem because there are various forms of media that people can use to communicate whatever it is on their mind. Um, we just have to make sure we're prepared to protect staff um, against any and all attacks that are irresponsible and um, reprehensible. So, John, what was the language that you read earlier? Excuse me? Mr. Donias, what was the language oh, that you read earlier from that other policy? Yeah, so specific, there was an interesting language, use of mm -hmm. language there. So the uh, hostile environment means that the victim subjectively views the conduct as harassment or bullying and that the conduct, conduct is objectively severe or pervasive enough that a reasonable person would agree that it is harassment or bullying. A hostile environment may be created through pervasive or persistent misbehavior or a single incident is sufficiently severe. And again, that's from the North Carolina School Board. Okay. So we're, we're just embarking on this on this topic, so I would love to close it um, unless there are any other comments. But what I was going to say, though, because I think, I think Mr. Funch brought up at the end the tension point again between free speech rights and a policy like this. And I, I want to just say it again. We said it at the beginning. Multiple people have said it during. We've said it toward the end. Now we're going to say it again at the end. We, we are going to actively be ensuring and thinking about ways to ensure that the public's right to engage, criticize, speak in ways that sometimes feels untoward um, are always protected, period. And so that's going to be hard to do. And I think as Mr. Menino suggested earlier, <laughs> We'll see if we can even come up with a policy <laughs> that feels workable in the end. So it's not, this isn't a, this, we're, we are committed to that. I heard it from everyone else who's sitting here. I'm sitting in this chair. The only way I'm moving forward with this is if we keep that tension point honest. But I also think that the language that Ms. Ardonia has just read is meaningful. It's very meaningful. And it starts to set a standard for what we're looking at and understanding when we see something that we think could constitute harassment and bullying. And I think the plain use of ordinary language and ordinary perspective and evidence can suggest people why it's important to try to address it as a committee and as a community. So, so just very briefly, something I meant to say earlier, it's just another stakeholder group, whether they literally sit on a subcommittee or just, or just gathered feedback, might be um, some of the heads of our employee, employee associations. Um, because certainly in um, some of the instances, there's been um, concerns raised from that vantage point as well. So just, I don't wanna, you know, administrators make sense and I'm not against, it's not disagreeing with that, but they might be another resource um, or sounding board or 
Um, I think it'd be a good connection to make. Yes. Yeah. I did forget saying that earlier. Uh, okay, we're moving on on the agenda. The, la the last item we have before adjournment is accepting gifts. Mr. Brennan, do you have anything on your mind? I move to accept the following gifts. From R.K. Miles to support donation of lumber to make dividers, a uh, total estimate of $200. From Lisa and Matt Kane, number 2484, to support field hockey remaining fundraiser donation in the amount of $45.41 for a total of $45.41. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded by Mrs. McDonald. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by raising your hand. It carries unanimously, uh, seven to nothing. Um, do you have any, any Mrs. Donia, do you have anything further on your mind? I would like to move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Spitzer. Uh, this is not debatable. All those in favor? Carries unanimously. We are adjourned.